Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this uh, mini symposium, Extreme Load in Non-Structures, that we are traditionally organizing with uh, academician uh, Morozov and Dr. Prakashikov. We have a very interesting uh, schedule uh, today. A, the first uh, lecture, the key, keynote lecture, will be uh, presented by Professor Nobili from uh, Italy, from uh, Modena, and the title is uh, Wave Propagation in uh, Microstructured Media for Non-Destructive uh, Testing. Me, myself, I'm really interested in uh, to see the presentation. If you have... Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, Andrea. Uh, hello, hello, everybody. Yeah, you have a total of uh, 30 minutes, including questions. So use uh, timers. As you wish. Yeah, please, the podium is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And I know that, you know, just after lunch is a very difficult time, so I try to keep it as light, as, po as digestible as possible. So I just try to give an overview and not a lot of mathematics, but just the idea, the, the, the underlying idea. So let me first uh, thank all the organizers of this very, very nice conference. I've been, uh, I've been in the conference also last year. And the general understanding was that we would have been able to see St. Petersburg, you know. And in fact, we would be given a guided tour, virtual tour, to see St. Petersburg. And, and, but we never could because of the pandemic. And this year again. So I really, I'm really hopeful for next year that, that it'll be the good one. So, you know, try three times and succeed. <laughs> But, you know, thank you for the organizer. Thank you for, uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Danila for inviting me to give this lecture. So let me first share my screen, which is always something that, so please tell me if you see my screen. Do you? Do you see my screen? See. Yes, we do. Yes, we see your screen. Okay, thank you very much. So you should go full screen. Okay. So the idea of today's talk is to give you an overview of uh, new trends in non-destructive testing and a connection with uh, other fields, for instance, seismic uh, surveying and wave propagation. So the, 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 the overview, the framework of the talk will be a little bit of motivation, which will be a long bit, by the way, with a bit of history. And, and then we will get into the matter. I will give some overview of couple stress elasticity. We will derive the secular equation for love waves. And then we see the application for non-destructive testing. Since the time is a premium, I'll be go as fast as I can, but I will try to be clear. So let's start with the motivation. So uh, the quest for proving the existence of new types of localized waves, which are similar in nature to Rayleigh waves, began shortly after the the, the, the found of, of, of Rayleigh Way by Lord Rayleigh in 1885. So in fact, in 1911, Love investigated the possibility of waves propagating at the free surface of a layer in perfect contact with a half space. And this was interesting because he tried to explain the reason why these waves kept appearing in seismographs, which were starting to being recorded at the time. And people were baffled by these because they kept seeing waves that look like Rayleigh waves, but they are horizontally polarized. And classical theory of elasticity cannot account for sheer horizontal uh, Rayleigh waves. And so it was a problem, and then Love comes with this beautiful idea. Why don't we introduce a microstructure in the structure of the Earth? So why don't we account for two layers? And by doing this, basically remedied one of the problem of classical elasticity, which is the fact that there is no, no internal length scale. And, and then he finds love ways. But then in 1924, and again in 1954, Sternley investigated the existence of wave localized at the surface of two materials, of two infinite, inf, semi-infinite materials. And the, the reason of his interest was to determine whether energy could escape at the interface between what was at the time beginning to be known, the layer structure of the Earth. So people started to understand that the Earth is not like a full solid, but is structured. So microstructure again, micro in terms of the Earth dimensions. And a question that he was trying to answer was, have we got energy being able to escape 
uh, at the surface between two layers. And he concludes that we can definitely assert that we have the when the wave velocity are not too widely different for the two media, a wave of Rayleigh type can exist at the interface. So we, are now, we now saw three types of localized wave, Rayleigh waves, love waves, and then Stonely waves. But then precise quantification of the range of existence of Stonely waves came much later by Scholte in 1947. And Scholte conditions are very restrictive. There is a very nice paper in Nature about this uh, by Musgrave. Which, which shows that you know, out of 900 possible combination of homogeneous material, you get, you get short, uh, Stonely wave only 31 times. So it's much of a coincidence rather than the, the, the usual condition to have Stonely waves in solids. And then in 1950, Kayser introduced acoustic emission as non-destructive testing. So we are now seeing non-destructive testing in this talk for the first time. So, so it's not a, a, a whole of a lot of time ago that we've used acoustic emissions for looking into inside objects. It's just, you know, 70 years, uh, a little bit more. Um, and then it, the dispersion nature of Rayleigh wave was definitely established in, in the early 1950s. So again, it's not a long time ago that we know that Rayleigh waves are not, uh, they are dispersive. And this is very important for non-destructive testing and seismic surveying. And then since, the, since then, the study of the interior structure of the earth by Rayleigh waves and bulk waves, but particularly as I shall presently present, uh, was taken from records of natural earthquakes begun. So we have a long wave of studies of the structure of the earth, which is exactly what happens a few years afterwards in non-destructive testing, starting from the 1950. So people realize the power of these waves and the capacity to penetrate and investigate any object. But then only after the 1970s, Rayleigh waves stimulated by manpower. So technically it, would pos it was possible to stimulate Rayleigh waves in solids. And they started to be used in geological surveying uh, of shallow strata. And then soon afterwards, they were started being used in problems of uh, non-destructive testing. So it's even less that we have been using these kind of waves to see the structure of things. It's only 50 years. And as you probably know, the, 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 the procedure works as, as this. The velocity of propagation of any body wave, so I'm talking about body waves now, in any homogeneous material is determined by the elastic modulus over the density, basically. So the idea is if you measure the, the, the flight time of these waves, you have an idea of the different material it crosses. But the traditional seismic survey uses only compressional waves. So the first body waves, the, the, the fastest body waves for two reasons. The first is that it's easiest to measure because it has a normal component. Also it crosses liquids and then it's the fastest. So it's the first that, you, that it gets to you. So there is no, not a problem of it being mixed with other waves. So for these two reasons, uh, the traditional seismic survey uses only one wave. But then nowadays it's starting to become more and more important to use multi-component survey, which is to record different kinds of waves at the same time, because it's now possible to measure stress and surface waves. Uh, and this provides a lot of information, which puts a great challenge in our theoretical understanding of the phenomenon and data processing but at the same time solves one of the major problem of these kind of things, which carries over to non-destructive testing is exactly the same thing. The two, the two fields are very closely correlated. And the problem is that the inverse problem of wave propagation is a non-linear problem. So you always have no uniqueness in your solution. So how do you solve this? It's always very difficult to find a, a defect if you're looking at scattered waves, reflected waves, because you're looking at the back problem the inverse problem. And this provides multiple solutions. So to reduce the risk of multiple solution, you use multi-component survey. And this is exactly what is, is taking place in non-destructive testing now. So non-destructive testing basically is based on this idea, as I already mentioned, you propagate either acoustic waves from outside or you propagate uh, man-generated man Rayleigh waves on the surface. And then you're trying to look at reflections or time flights of the weight 
if you have access to both sides, for instance, uh, you don't need reflection if you have, which is impossible in the case of Earth, of course, unless you're looking at the opposite side of the Earth. And, and then this gives you the information that you need. But the processing required is complicated and you have to have a very good understanding. So far, there are a few case studies in which the resolution detail of the object detected with surface waves is more than several millimeters. So the, 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 the resolution power of modern techniques is not that great. You cannot go below several millimeters. To do that, you have to go to higher frequencies. And this is difficult because higher frequencies have more, um, you know, they dissipate quickly because they are high energy and they dissipate quickly in material. The frequency band of surface waves has to be shifted from low to high as the size of resolution detail changes from large to small. So if you want to see something small, you have to have a very high uh, frequency. And this is difficult because then you have a lot of features that classical elasticity cannot capture, for instance, dispersion. This results in a series of technical requirements for surface waves methods, such as stimulation. So you need to stimulate high frequency waves observation and analysis. When we are looking at love wave in non-destructive testing, this is the forefront of the, of the subject. So people are more and more trying now to move from traditional Rayleigh waves to love waves. Why do we do that? Because a love wave is a, is a propagating shear mode wave supported on semi-infinite substrate with a waveguide layer. An important potential field application of love wave is evaluation of laminated material at coatings. This is very important because lab waves is localized in the interface between two materials. So it's very good if you want to look for defects there. And this is exactly what you need to do when you're looking at laminated materials, such as layer silicates, thin film nanocomposites. All of this have a problem of detachment from you know, the layer and the substrate. Also, the absence of a wave component normal to the surface makes love wave especially attractive for NAMs and ultrasonic transducers. Because in that case, you want to generate the power in only one direction. You don't want to bother with the material in the other direction. And, and these localized features is, and these plain features with no boundary, basically, is, is very attractive for transducers, for instance. However, these types of surface waves have not yet become an everyday tool for practical non-destructive testing application. Why is it so? If they, are, if they are so promising, why they are not widespread applied? The reason is this, of this delay is a gap between the pure theory and the practical needs laying in the interpretation of measuring result. One of these problems I already mentioned, the fact that you are talking about an inverse problem. The more complicated the problem, the more difficult becomes the inverse problem. Another interesting part that I would like to mention, although it's not strictly correlated, and it regards Rayleigh waves again, is to do with uh, microseism. It's interesting because now it's a, it's a long story I could tell, but I haven't got enough time. Uh, th there's a lot of interest in microseism, and they and a lot of frequency in these microseism are constituted by love waves, uh, and they are, have low intensity and they are not measured all the time. So it's now quite widespread idea that love waves are generated near coastlines. But a definitive explanation for love wave generation has not been provided, but several mechanisms have been suggested. So despite the fact that love waves have been discovered in 1911, there's still a lot going on about love waves, a lot of things that are not uh, completely understood and they are measured, like in the days of the early seismograms. Okay, let's look as a final slide for the introduction, uh, the situation in classical elasticity. Classical elasticity is a very wonderful tool. We all lo love classical elasticity, but there are some few things that fail to please. There are some things that cannot capture the experiment very well. And this is, of course, something that happens with every theory, no matter how good the theory might be. It cannot be applied in general. So for instance, in classical elasticity, Rayleigh waves are non-dispersive, and we know that they are. Anti-plane Rayleigh waves are not supported, and they, we know that they exist. Stoneley waves almost never appear, at least in homogeneous materials, and we measure them. Anti-plane Stoneley waves are not supported again, and love waves are dispersive, which is exactly what it, it's measured. So this is correct, a correct uh, prediction. So I'm not saying that we should 
eliminate uh, classical elasticity. I'm just saying that we have to move away from classical elasticity if you want to say something deeper. If you want to see something at the small scale, we need to incorporate from the microstructure in the material. There's no way around it. So I think that to this question, should we stick to classical elasticity? Yes, we should, but sometimes we should not. If we have to see, if we want to see something deeper, the real problem is which theory shall we move to in order to improve from classical elasticity? To that question, I don't have an answer. I only have, uh, uh, so when we move from classical elasticity, we move into the realm of complex materials. Complex material account for the structure, the internal structure of the material. So they are in between atomistic models and co purely continuum models. They are still continuum, but they want to incorporate non-continuum non features, basically, <coughs> microstructural features. So I'm now presenting couple stress materials for two reasons. Uh, because they are the simplest uh, materials that account for microstructure with only two parameters. So this is one way of looking at it. So from a theoretical standpoint, this is a very attractive property. We could be looking at, uh, for instance, non-local materials, but they are much harder to deal with. And another thing is that in recent literature, there's more and more evidence that couple stress really exists. There are a few papers that recently appears that point to, to the appearance of disclination as an underlying mechanism from some physical phenomena that are being measured. And these entirely rely on couple stresses. So couple stresses, as you all well know, are uh, the extra force, the, the couple that appears when considering interaction between two parts of the body. So you have the traction vector, but if the traction is, vector is not acting precisely at the center point of the small area, you have also a couple. And this is described by this couple stress tensor. Basically. So I'm not pretending this is the best possible description. I'm just giving you one description. Uh, and of course, the result that we will see will, will the, the question that we are trying to answer is, how does the microstructure affect the propagation features of these waves that we introduce in the introduction? How does Rayleigh, Stoneley, and, and, and particularly love, we are, we've been interested in love waves, how do they change? And how can we use this for new non-destructive testing? Okay, so I promise no mathematics, and I, I just give you a few slides, very, very few on with formulae. And this is the classical equation of couple stress theory. I will not describe them too much. I would just say that there is a rotation vector, which is phi given by equation two, which would be a separate independent degree of freedom in micropolar theory. But in couple stress theory, it's related as in equation two to the displacement. So we are talking about a latent microstructure. So the microstructure exists, but it's completely related to the macrostructure. And then we have the curvature tensor chi, which is the gradient of phi. We separate the tension in symmetric and skew symmetric part. And we, on, in terms of boundary condition, have two classes of boundary condition. The classical uh, force conditions, which is P. So you impose a force on the surface, or a traction vector. And the more exotic couple stress condition. So you apply the couple stress on the surface, which is Q. And then you have a constitutive equation for isotropic material, which is very similar to Lame equations for, for classical materials. On the left, you have sigma, which is the symmetric part of the stress tensor. And there you have the two Lame moduli. And on the right of equation five, you have the couple stress tensor, which is given by two parameters, L, which is a characteristic length. And this is the interesting part of the theory. You, cannot, you can now account for a characteristic length inside the material, the microstructure. And then you have eta, which is the same as a, a Poisson uh, ratio. So it gives you the degree of anisotropy. Let's, I, I, I wouldn't say anisotropy, but the difference in the two direction when you're looking at couple stresses. So the, the deformation related to couple stresses. So the material, uh, particularly the material parameter L and eta may be directly related to experiments. So this is a classical question. How do we relate the material parameters to experiments? And they are easily found by experimenting in bending and torsion at different scales. Because the, the smaller the scale, the more the microstructure becomes important and its effect 
uh, is, is becoming relevant. And if you do bending tests at different scales, you find a different behavior, which can be accounted for by this constant. So LB is the bending length in, in the length in bending, and LT is the length in torsion. And there are papers that give you material constants with these experiments. And then finally, I will just show the, the uh, equilibrium equation, which are very classical. 7A is just a traditional translational equilibrium, and 7B and 7C are rotational equilibrium. But there's a third material property, which is rotational microinertia, J. So this accounts for how hard it is to accelerate a rotation in the microstructure. OK, so this is enough for the equation. Well, there is one final one. We can put everything together. So the, the skew-symmetric part of the Cauchy stress can be determined by rotational equilibrium. You can put everything together. You get the equivalent on a V equation, which is equation 10, which is now a sort of biharmonic equation. So it's a higher order equation. And this will give us more phenomena, as, as you would expect. OK, let's now look at love waves. How do love waves change when we are incorporating microstructure in, in a uh, phenomenological model. Um, so as, as you already know, love waves are propagating at the discontinuity surface between the half space A and the guiding layer B. So it's the plane X2 equal to zero. So we have a wave there, which is localized. And uh, we can introduce a general form of the Rayleigh function. So this is the Rayleigh function for couple stress materials. It's interesting because you can specialize it to either the layer B or the hard space A. You just have to put lambda one and lambda two, the decay indexes of the two materials with their properties. Okay, now we are in a position to develop the secular equation for love waves. And it's very simple, it's equation 13. It's very complicated, but you can, you can factor it in, two, in three terms. The first term, and you can see them very clearly, because the first term D0 is the terms that really matters when gamma is small. What is gamma? Gamma is the ratio between the stiffness of the layer over the stiffness of the half space. So imagine gamma is very small. So for instance, the stiffness of the layer is very, is very weak. So you basically have Rayleigh waves. And you can see this because you have Ra. So the only term that really matters where gamma is small, these two terms disappear, so you only have D0. And this is basically Rayleigh wave in the, in the half space. But there is another way that gamma can be small. Gamma can be small when GA is large. That is when the half space is very, very stiff. And when the half space is very, very stiff, as you can understand, if the half space is very, very stiff, what you have is Rayleigh lamp waves with a top free surface and a bottom clamped surface. And this is precisely what you have. This is the dispersion relation of the secular equation for Rayleigh lamp waves, which are free on top and clamped on the bottom. Then you have one term here, which is a coupling term between these two extreme cases. And then you have another term, which is the other extreme cases, when gamma is large. So when gamma is large, the layer predominates. And what you basically have is Rayleigh lamp waves. So this structure is the same in classical elasticity, but it's interesting to point it out because if you can measure more than one wave, you, you know really everything. The, the inverse problem becomes much easier because if you can measure Rayleigh waves, which is D0 basically, and also love waves, which is capital D0, then your inverse problem is unique. And I'm not going to show this, but you know it's understandable because you have more information. And then you can do more because you can use the argument principle. You can number the, you can find the number, the existence and uniqueness of love roots in this uh, polynomial well, transcendental equation. And you find a condition by the argument principle, a condition for existence of these waves. So the intro introducing the microstructure is such that love waves do not always exist. For them to exist, you have this inequality to, to be fulfilled. And it's very easy to see the mechanical interpretation of this equality. If you put the equal sign here, what you're looking at here is that the, the, the wave number of the love waves is the same as the wave number of the bulk wave in the half space. So your love wave is moving at the same speed, so to speak, as the bulk wave. 
And so you have an internal resonance phenomenon. You have that the low wave triggers bulk waves in the half space, and then all the energy is radiated away. And this is the reason why you have cut on and cut off. So the quality is easy to understand, much less to understand the inequality. So let, let's now look at what happens in practical terms, because uh, I'm running out of time. So you, you, as I already mentioned, you have a pass, a pass band and a gap band uh, structure in your propagation, unlike classical uh, elasticity. Uh, for instance, if you have the stiffness of, la of the layer here at the bottom, you can see that you have these black curves that it's the caton frequency, because this is the frequency. So you have to reach a certain frequency to start propagating. This is the pass area and this is the no pass area. So this curve described caton and it asymptotes to Rayleigh Lamb waves, which is the red curve. But if you're looking from afar, so if you're looking from a distance, you see that this is only the caton, but there is also cutoff, which is this one. So you have an infinite number of, of propagation bands, which are limited between cutoff and caton. And caton is always related to symmetric Rayleigh Lamb waves. Cutoff is always anti-symmetric Rayleigh Lamb waves in the, in the layer. And this is particularly true because this is an asymptotic behavior if you're looking for gamma large. If you're looking for gamma small, you, you see that your caton and cutoff frequency are always related to Rayleigh Lamb waves in a free clamp plate, which can be easily deduced by the, the dispersion relation before. So you have this propagation regime, which is very useful for non-destructive testing because it's much easier to find cutoff frequencies. And by the cutoff frequency or cutoff frequencies, you can determine the internal microstructure in your inverse problem, rather than to study the full wave. So th this pass, air, pass, no pass structure is characteristic of a microstructural substrate. But then this also depends on the internal inertia of the material, and I'm getting to the conclusion. Uh, so this is, for instance, again, the, the, this is this uh, frequency spectrum for two values of gamma. You can see cut on and then cut off, exactly as predicted by the uniqueness in existing conditions. If you increase the internal inertia of the material, so it's, if it's harder to rotate the material, you, you transition from a multiple cut-on, cut-off, so multiple passband regime to one passband regime, which is this one, only one passband, which is again encased between Rayleigh Lamb waves. And this can be seen again in the frequency spectrum. You have cut-on and cut-off. And again, you can see that cut-on and cut-off are in between the bulk wave speed. So there is a narrow strip where you can, your wave can move and when it hits the bulk wave speed, it stops or starts. But then you have only one propagation bands and other propagation regimes are possible. So you can also, looking at the propagation patterns of Rayleigh wave, determine how the microstructure is in, qualita in qualitative terms. Okay, I'm getting to the conclusion. So this is the end. Uh, Incorporating microstructure into the material leads to a non-classical band structure for low wave propagation. So if you have a material with a microstructure, you don't expect to have a continuous uh, propagation pattern. This structure may be conveniently back processed for non-destructive testing evaluation of the material microstructure. In fact, it's simple to determine experimentally cut-on and cut-off frequencies, and then compute by the condition of existence the microstructural parameters. Furthermore, since you have this nice uh, disper dispersion structure, you can warrant uniqueness of the inverse problem by looking at two observables. So if you look love waves and Rayleigh waves together, you can find a unique solution. So I thank you very much for your attention. And this is a very quick uh, bibliographic uh, reference. Thank you. I hope I've been in time. Yeah, thank you very much for this plenary. Uh, well, I'm not sure if you followed the uh, plenary lectures in the morning, but we had uh, Professor Wolfgang Müller from uh, Germany. Uh, after every single presentation, he was saying that that is very stimulating. And definitely your presentation was very stimulating, at least uh, for me. Thank uh, you very much. <laughs>
really very, very interesting and straightforward uh, theory leading to uh, very interesting uh, con conclusions. So if I may, I, I want to ask you the first uh, questions. You obviously were thinking about possible experiments. Yes, that, yes. I was expecting this question, yes. Yeah, to... I'm collaborating with one guy that should help me doing that. You know, this is very recent research, so I, this, this guy is doing a lot of uh, seismic experiments. So we are trying to do, uh, on a smaller scale for, for, for beginning, uh, a little experiment to see this uh, band propagation stack. The, the problem with the experiment is that it's always hard. If you're looking at back process data, it's always hard to determine one possible solution. So it could be that, you know, my interpretation, my theoretical interpretation is correct, but it could be also completely wrong. And the way that the, 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 the signal operates in the material may, may lead to a false conclusion, may, may try to, may, may induce you to think that you are correct. So this is the major obstacle that we are finding. So one experiment will not tell you the truth. We have to do very many experiments to rule out all the possibility because the problem is not linear. So we just started. Yeah, but what I may think about is having like a layer of sand on top of something, something bulk, and then uh, initiate some kind of wave and see how, yeah. how yeah, the the wave propagation is uh, different from what classical the uh, theory. Yeah. Yeah, we are trying with sandwich panels first, so we will not have a completely uh, infinite uh, boundary on on the bottom and which is very difficult to realize in practice but we are hoping through measuring also the signal at the bottom to to subtract it from the scatter signal back so it's very complex but i'm not doing this because <laughs> luckily i mean I, I i i sought for help for a very strong group yeah but anyway we are looking forward to see the the results the experimental results maybe next year yeah, let's go, let's go, yeah, in, in St. Petersburg. Yeah, that, this is what I was saying, hopefully you will be able to join us here in St. Petersburg. Uh, I should give a possibility for others to ask uh, questions, those who are online, you should press uh, raise your hand button or something like that if, if you want to ask uh, questions. Do there is a question in Zoom from Victor Yermev. Yeah, uh, Professor Yermev, please. Hello, Victor. Hey. Ciao, ciao, Andrea. Nice, nice to, uh, to hear your lecture. I have just a question from, let's say, theoretical point of view. When you consider it, for example, the Kaupo stress theory, you consider it some kind of boundary conditions and the free, free surface. Yeah. But in this case, it could be some kind of also interesting behavior related to some coupling between rotations and uh, rotations, let, let's say macro rotations and displacement. It could be like third type of boundary conditions. Yeah, that's true. That's that's very interesting. Also, I didn't mention that I I I studied the, the subcases when the uh, internal length scale of the material goes to zero in either the half space or in the layer, and I found that this one of these two cases is not well posed. And so I mentioned this because you are correct. There is a lot of possibilities to consider, and also the limiting cases can be considered. So I will probably try to do weaker conditions if the experiments also are not looking good we will try to impose weaker condition at the interface because it's very hard to have perfect continuity of a stress and couple stress at the interface. So you, you, you are correct, yeah. But I okay. didn't do that. Okay, grazie mille. <laughs> grazie. Uh, a dopo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe one uh, fast question. I have a lot of questions myself, but we are starting to run out of time, but we can take maybe one fast question, somebody. If no, yeah, then let's uh, thank uh, Professor Nobili for this really fantastic presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, next presentation we will have that offline, so we have a presenter, but I hope everybody participating online will uh, have a good view and uh, a good uh, sound of the presentation. So I'm uh, a announcing uh, uh, Professor Lek Tkachenko from who traveled 
a long way here from uh, Far East, from Haha Barovsk, and he is uh, working at Computing Center of the Far Eastern Branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and the title for his talk is uh, a stress strain state of T-shaped joint of thin walled elastic pipes. You have 20 minutes, so the podium is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm grateful to organizing committee and especially Vladimir uh, Brato for the acceptation of my our reports. Yes. This is a report with uh, Rebecca Anderson. Yeah. And um, we can start. The topicality uh, is uh, that we have um, leaves, leaves uh, the focus of research related to the occurrence of extreme stress and um, in pipelines. This is the theory of Waterhammer, starting from work of Joukowsky, theory of pipe stability, the impact of earthquakes of, on underground pipelines, and theory interaction, uh, fluid structure interaction. And uh, in standard uh, pre presentation of pipeline as we can in, um, introduce to robotics Thank you very much. Uh, I've started uh, this, um, this line take down. Can you uh, yeah. this line take down? It's critical. Thank you. And uh, we can determine the parameter lambda as a product of Air radius of pipe and uh, maximum of modulus of uh, curvature and axial line of pipe. And this parameter defines the geometry of pipeline. And first, the most interesting for us, and uh, second case uh, when limit uh, of this lambda tends to infinity and uh, pipelines uh, profile with singularity. According to the uh, second case, we introduce um, problem statement for cylindrical shells of a uh, T-joint in displacement. Then we um, introduce two, two pipes, uh, intersection, intersection by right angle, and on in, uh, define Cartesian coordinates uh, and two cylindrical co coordinates. Each uh, pipe has his um, cylindrical coordinates x theta rho 1 and z phi rho 2. And first is standard for um, shell theory assumption and second assumption is um, additionally the ratio of radii less than 150. We provide very basic uh, shell theory equations membrane theory shells for each pipe. Uh, index uh, indicate number of pipe U V W W e, um, displacement in axial 
an envelope and um, radio coordinates. For first pipe, this is big pipe with big radius. And second pipe, it's small radius. We uh, get six equations in displacement. And we uh, add to them boundary conditions with standard boundary conditions on open ends of pipeline on, on these on this ends. Open ends. And uh, communication conditions. On shell connection line, the omega. First three connection conditions means uh, for uh, only geometrical conditions for displacement. And uh, last condition is force condition. To simplify the original problem, we can express uh, uh, y, 1 and 2, w, sorry, I go else, w1 and w2 through other displacement, u, y, v, and p. This is pressure in pipe. And uh, after that, we can get uh, system equations for these four equations. And conjugation conditions in the transformer statement are the, the same transform we can do in with conjugation conditions and with boundary conditions. The mechanical system has symmetry with respect to, to, to planes xz and yz. And um, we use the symmetry with respect to the plane xz, fig, uh, figure 3a, and we consider the positive values of coordinate y. and lower equations to uh, two dimensional form. Respect uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Two dimensional equations uh, of intersection cylindric shells in coordinate system have the form for big cylinder and um, for cylinder small ray R, R small. Here ux, v, y, w, z. This is displacement related to Cartesian coordinates uh, x, y, z. They have the same meaning for both cylinders in contrast uh, the, the system 3, 4. Uh, the result of the equations depends on two independent variables and the system reduced by 1. Is divided the system equations is divided into two subsystems. Proof is very short because uh, we using only these equations for coordinate way and. Um, we consider the positive part of cylinders and uh, we need only one, two, three, four, only four equations for transforming coordinate y. And, uh, here are boundary conditions in English transformation for boundary conditions on these uh, lines exclude segment AB exclude segment AB why, why it is direct we 
make assumption r small to over r big less than one fifth and um, this we can we, uh, suppose that a b is direct segment of line of uh, first uh, for, on section one four seven simple using um, formula state and get this boundary condition uh, on sections two six eight three five we take into account method aligning compliant relative to the plane x, z, and uh, symmetric character of displacement distributions vy, and uh, we assume vy equal zero. And uh, last, uh, on the rest uh, segments, we uh, use this Equations. Thus, we get boundary conditions for the remaining section. And uh, next, boundary conditions on uh, AB, on the segment AB. We get this for um, cylinder with big radi radius, and uh, this. 11, 12 for cylinder with small radius. And uh, these uh, equations, uh, these conditions uh, was uh, derived after using formula state taking, uh, and um, force condition we uh, get uh, after transfer this transformation applied to last conditions only this this is false condition and um, after that we get this uh, trouble we have um, by quality z equal r big the first condition satisfied identically we lost one condition and um, this conjugation conditions is shear forces with it about this condition is uh, s1 equal minus s2 and um, from it, we obtain two boundary conditions uh, when we use the vacuous sleeve contact uh, conditions. Uh, this is means that physically, when we, um, when we um, small pipe inserted in big pipe, like absolutely smooth sleeve and we get conditions uh, 10 and 12. So, uh, for estimating of accuracy of the last assumption, we perform numerical, numerical experiment and this numerical experiment uh, was performed for um, three-dimensional case and um, in shell case, both for three-dimensional pinned element and for shell pinned element. Here is three-dimensional case. This is uh, conditions of um, full connection to pipes using. And we can clearly see our these experiments were performed in 
Dit is een free card system. Dit is standaard pakket, standaard mathematical mechanical pakket of software. And uh, in this pocket we um, construct uh, 3D model and uh, by finite element method get this result. We can see uh, high stress in entrance angle in entrance angle. And this uh, stress has the maximum value of for me the stress is 276 megapascal. Here is histogram of uh, stress distribution by nodes of by nodes of uh, finite element mesh. And the next we um, change we change the connection T-shaped connection to sleeve contact conditions like, the, like this um, um, small pipe insert in big pipe and uh, these pipes we can const uh, we construct GMSH mesh for both pipes like for um, for both for each pipe and uh, this result on this mesh uh, and the stress distribution of on the nodes of mesh are same like in previous case and um, not relative error of course it's uh, another sense Maximum value of the for me the stress. Okay. Maximum value of for me the stress is uh, 268 megapascal. The guaranteed deviation is about 3 person, which is in this case is negligible. And conclusion: mathematical model constructed uh, two-dimensional model constructed and this model reduced uh, to two, two boundary value problems in rectangular or domains are obtained as a result. This is main result. We transform uh, ori original problem to two boundary value problems on rectangles. This is my result. Yeah. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, questions uh, from the audience or online audience? There is a question in Zoom from Victor Yermey. Yeah, Victor, please. Okay, thank you. May I ask you how you model uh, your T joint? with T-joint and more details. 
how you transmit, I'm interested in how you transmit moments, uh, because in, let's say, in the so-called drilling moment cannot be translated, transmitted in the classical shell theory. Yes, I understand the question. Of course, uh, this is not exactly technical model. This is model for um, develop mathematical method. And when we finished this mathematical method, we can uh, extrapolate it to moment shell. This is next step in our work. So it's first we uh, do all mathematical steps. We get uh, very simple statement, uh, very simple problem on two rectangles. And uh, we know how to do that. And um, next step for shallow shells, for shallow shells, we do the same steps for that same mathematical problem. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Спасибо большое. Yeah, thank you. Maybe one uh, more fast question. Oh. Yeah, we are starting to run out of time, so we proceed with the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. We have the presenter uh, The next uh, presentation is to be given by uh, Francesco Dal Corso from Italy again. Uh, well, it's uh, maybe online participants also know we are now experiencing uh, hottest days in the history of St. Petersburg. So we have plus 34 right now, which yeah. was uh, ever before registered in uh, St. Petersburg. So we kind of exchanged uh, weathers with uh, Europe. We had a presentation from UK on uh, Monday, and they told that they experienced one of the coldest days they ever saw in uh, summer. So maybe you say something, how is it going in uh, Italy in the beginning of your presentation? Otherwise, you have 20 minutes. Yeah, so, it's very hot. Since uh, 10 days here uh, in Italy, it's very hot. So now it's uh, 32 degrees. So we have more. Yeah, yeah, you have more for now. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction. So in my presentation, I will uh, first uh, give some uh, preliminary concept on uh, configurational forces uh, and uh, some of uh, previous results obtained uh, within the framework of structural mechanics. Then uh, we will pass to present uh, the problem and uh, specifically we will form formulate the problem and uh, we will obtain the governing equation. And then we will move to the finite element discretization in order to solve the problem and uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, the numerical prediction that are obtained. So, what are configurational forces? Uh, uh, configurational forces have been introduced uh, something like uh, 50 years ago by Ashley, uh, the famous mechanician. And uh, he introduced this concept uh, in order to describe the motion of uh, defects uh, within uh, a solid. So, the idea is... Um, the idea is to have some defect within a solid, then we will build uh, the potential energy at equilibrium for fixed position of these defects. And then if, if we take the partial derivative, uh, the negative value of this partial derivative with respect to the uh, variation of the um, defect uh, uh, position, uh, if we obtain a non-null force, that will be a configurational or HB force uh, that will... Uh, tend to move the defect to uh, an equilibrated configuration. And uh, this concept has been exploited through the years to, in the concept of uh, solid mechanics to motivate different behaviors, uh, as for example, the crack, the crack advance or the pitch color force for the motion of dislocation, but also for the phase boundary motion. So uh, some year ago, more like eight, year ago, eight years ago, we will uh, we we were wondering if uh, this concept uh, could have been uh, a counterpart uh, uh, in addition to this uh, to the solid mechanics framework, also in uh, structural mechanics. And the uh, reply was positive, and um, the presence of the configurational force relies on the 
on the presence of this uh, special uh, constraint that is a sliding sleeve. So the sliding sleeves, the sliding sleeve allows for the uh, tangential motion, but no vertical motion and no, uh, sorry, for this tangential motion, but not normal motion or uh, rotation. And uh, through uh, variational, but also other approaches, we have uh, um, obtained that this system, which has uh, not only the rotation field, but also a configurational parameter describing itself, uh, provides uh, um, an equilibrium equation along the, the axial direction that uh, defines the presence of uh, a non-null tangential force here at the uh, exit of the sliding sleeve. And uh, this force is non-linear and is given by the square of the bending moment uh, divided the two times the bending stiffness of the road. We are now considering a linear elastic road. So we, we then um, uh, validated that this uh, force uh, experimentally. So here you see a config co equilibrium configuration for which the um, the tangent component of this load is equilibrated by the configurational force. And then by uh, decreasing or increasing this force, we will obtain the injection or the ejection of the system. So we have uh, recently extended this concept also within a dynamic framework, and we have obtained that this force uh, defines the, giant, the jump in the internal uh, axial action at the sliding sleeve exit. And uh, we have also tested our prediction um, by considering a specific evolutive problem uh, where defined by the presence of uh, a two-dimensional parameter, the inclination of this uh, sliding sleeve and uh, the, the dimensionless load that is given by M, that is the mass uh, angled at this end, uh, G, that is the gravity acceleration, L0, that is the initial and deformed length, and B is the uh, bending stiffness. So we have been able to define two regions in this plane where uh, couples of uh, P alpha values will give a final ejection and couples of uh, P alpha values will give injections. So uh, these two regions colored uh, have been defined through theory and also have been uh, confirmed by experiments. Uh, so here we will see some movie. And then uh, we will define uh, a sort of transition value, uh, a transition curve for which uh, we are moving from injection to ejection as a final stage. So we start uh, for both of these stages as a uh, and the form of the rectilinear configuration, then we release the, the mass at this uh, end, and then we will have these trajectories. On the left case, we have uh, a, values, a value of P uh, smaller than uh, this transition value, so we are in the green region, and indeed we are ending up with the injection, complete ejection. On the right, uh, we are above the transition curve, so we, are, we have final ejection. So now the idea is to consider a, a more complicated problem given by the presence of a sliding sleep that can move in time. So we will define the three degrees of freedom of the sliding sleep as varying in time. So we have the horizontal, um, vertical, and uh, the inclination of this point that is varying in time. For, to this purpose, it is, uh, um, is useful to define uh, uh, the position of the points along the road as uh, um, in different systems. So the absolute system that is uh, uh, fixed uh, um, with, no, with no reference with the sliding sleeve, and uh, also a relative system where we have uh, the position with respect to the uh, moving uh, reference system. So here we need to build up a Lagrangian that is given by the difference of uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And then we have also the presence of uh, uh, different uh, uh, Lagrangian multipliers in order to, um, to consider the inextensibility and also the constraint uh, about the position of this uh, end. So uh, by, uh, through the principle of least action, we obtain uh, the dynamic equations 
we obtain uh, the constraint, uh, the governing the problem, and uh, finally we obtain also the interface condition uh, expressed uh, in a different way uh, from uh, what we observed before with uh, other formulations that were not uh, position-based but rotation-based. But essentially, uh, this equation is equivalent to the previous, uh, the, the, the previous expression that uh, defines that the jump uh, at the exit in the, in the axial uh, force is just the square of the uh, bending moment divided two times the bending stiffness. And this equation has to be solved in terms of uh, the uh, position vector, the configurational parameter that is L, and also these Lagrangian multipliers. So in order to solve that system of uh, partial, differen uh, partial differential equation plus an algebraic equation, we, uh, we perform a discretization in, in uh, space and in time so that we get uh, a nonlinear system of equations to be solved uh, in a, a vector for different uh, uh, times. And uh, this is the final uh, form of uh, our uh, nonlinear system that can be defined by these two uh, vectorial equations, where all the components are obtained here. And uh, um, we have uh, uh, considered a um, cubic uh, Hermit spline for the position vector and the linear polynomials for the Lagrangian multipliers. So we are now ready to solve some uh, evolutive problem. And uh, to this purpose, we consider uh, not the generic uh, um, motion of the sliding sleeve, but we are just considering a vertical sliding sleeve subject only to horizontal motion. And in particular, we are considering a sinusoidal motion of this uh, constraint. So under this case, uh, all the analysis uh, can, be, uh, um, can be investigated through uh, three different uh, dimensional parameters. So all the parameters uh, uh, inside this model just uh, uh, condense uh, in uh, three uh, values that are the, the dimensionless load, the dimensionless frequency of the ground motion, and the dimensionless amplitude of the ground motion. And uh, moreover, we have also to consider some initial condition for this motion that uh, can be, of course, uh, uh, any initial condition that may, we may consider, but we will focus on uh, absolute rest condition so that when we leave uh, the mass, uh, this will be with, uh, uh, for example, null position, null absolute position and null, veloc null absolute velocity, or uh, differently with relative uh, rest. So the conditions are uh, maintained on the uh, relative position and velocities. So here we are just focusing on some tentative values uh, uh, representative of uh, uh, some um, of our experimental uh, equipment and uh, uh, strips that we are um, we are used to investigate and uh, we report here uh, a map of uh, injected red spots and ejected blue spots um, configuration at varying the initial length and the time of release where this time is a difference with respect to the origin of the sinusoid. So here on the left, we have uh, absolute rest and uh, on the right, we have relative rest. And we may appreciate that uh, in the case of absolute rest, there is no uh, specific pattern in the behavior. But in the case of relative rest, we have a sort of sinusoidal uh, pattern where uh, below this sinusoid, we have uh, um, actually um, mainly injection. And uh, above this uh, sinusoid, we have uh, ejection. So with reference to this uh, relative rest, uh, we have uh, focused on uh, a pair of values. So uh, dimensionless uh, omega uh, five and dimensionless amplitude 0 0.04. And here we are uh, um, observing how the uh, external length of the road is uh, changing in time for different uh, values of P, considering this uh, relative rest condition. On the left, we have uh, uh, dissipation uh, introduced only by linear viscous dampis, damping, and on the right, also uh, friction uh, um, dissipation. So we may observe that there is a sort of transition. So we have, uh, uh, for example, for small p, uh, something like uh, ejection. Then we have uh, an intermediate region where we have uh, some uh, steady state motion where the length uh, initially varies and then uh, 
basically remains uh, almost the same value, constant. And then we have uh, for high values of P, a sort of uh, uh, motion that eventually defines uh, a, a complete ejection. And here we may appreciate uh, what happens by introducing the friction. So here we have the movies, uh, up, uh, upper part uh, only viscous damping, uh, lower part also with friction. And we may see from left to the right what uh, uh, how the trajectory is affected by increasing uh, the dimensionless load P. So we start uh, with small P with uh, um, ejection. And then uh, we have this uh, motion that uh, has some uh, variation in the length initially, and then uh, it stabilizes with uh, uh, almost constant uh, external length. And then we, by increasing further, we have a final injection. And uh, more or less the same can be said uh, for uh, the uh, case with friction, except that uh, we are losing uh, the ejection case. So we have collected uh, all these conditions and we have been able to uh, define, uh, let's say, two surfaces uh, within the three-dimensional space given by this uh, three-dimensional parameter. So the dimensionless load, the dimensionless frequency of the ground and the dimensionless displacement of the ground, defining the separation of the three different behaviors. So uh, here in the upper part, uh, above this uh, blue surface, we have the ejection. Between the, um, the blue surface and the red surface, we have a, a steady motion. And uh, below the red surface, we have observed to have uh, uh, injection, final injection. So this uh, is still ongoing computation and we are uh, still working on uh, all of this. Um, and uh, I just leave you with this uh, final slide where uh, I, I can anticipate some uh, experimental results that we are performing in our lab, where here you can see this uh, magnetic actuator and uh, the sliding sleeve realization. So we have uh, until now uh, performed only experiments uh, with the uh, relative, um, uh, relative, um, Mm, sorry, the absolute, uh, um, the, the absolute, the, the absolute rest conditions. And here you, uh, we may appreciate uh, the uh, the dynamic motion and with ejection. And here with uh, a final injection. As I said before, this uh, uh, absolute rest condition uh, most likely will lead to a random pattern. So we hope uh, uh, to be able to uh, realize this. Um, in a relative rest condition uh, in a couple of months and then to validate our uh, theoretical uh, predictions. Thank you very much for your attention. Obviously have something in uh, your hand, in uh, your head. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, hear uh, all the question. Yeah, I uh, wanted to ask what kind of application can this uh, be? So this should be some kind of, uh, I don't know what, where where the, these results can be used. So there's... Yeah, uh, this kind of, uh, um, can, so this type of research can be applied to soft locomotion, for example, in uh, robotics, uh, and also uh, in, I mean, in general, in uh, actuation. So, uh, by imposing, for example, a horizontal motion, we can have a, a, a transverse motion, yeah. vertical motion. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, questions from offline or online audience? Online audience, are there any questions? OK, then uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are moving to the next presentation that is from uh, Russia, Nizhny uh, Novgorod. Uh, Dmitry, are you here? Yeah, Dmitry, hello. Uh, so the presentation will be delivered, delivered by Dmitry uh, Lanzin with uh, co authors, and uh, he is working at Lomachevsky uh, University at uh, Nizhny uh, Novgorod. And the title for the presentation is uh, A Response of Fine Grained fiber reinforced concretes under dynamic compression. Uh, Dmitry, please share your screen and you have 20 minutes. Uh, hello, uh, topic of my report, one minute.
Hello, topic of my report is response of fine-grained fiber reinforced concrete under dynamic compression. Uh, currently, fiber reinforced concrete are being actively introduced in the building structures industry. Metal and non-metal pipes, uh, uh, which have adhesion along its surface to concrete, are used for fiber reinforced concrete. Fiber reinforced concrete is recommended to be used for high responsible construction. Uh, in such structures, the following technical advantages of fiber reinforced concrete can be effectively used in comparison with traditional concrete. Uh, increased crack resistance, impact strength, fracture toughness, uh, wear resistance, frost resistance, and uh, cavitation resistance, uh, as well as uh, reduced um, uh, shrinkage and creep. Cases of emergencies, which are accompanied by intense impacts and explosions, have become more frequent in recent years. Such a uh, situation occurs as a result of uh, natural disasters, terrorist attacks and uh, technological disasters. Therefore, it is uh, necessary to take into account these dynamic effects uh, when uh, designing responsible buildings and structures. Uh, dynamic effects are characterized uh, by condition, uh, continuous change of parameters uh, and high intensity. It is necessary to know the mechanical uh, properties of building materials and high uh, strain rates for um, rational and uh, reliable design of uh, dynamically loaded structures. Uh, in this uh, regard, the study of uh, behavior of modern structural building materials under high uh, rate loadings is a relevant problem. Uh, the report uh, present of results of dynamic tests uh, of different types of fiber reinforced concrete in comparison uh, with concrete matrix. Uh, dynamic tests of fiber reinforced concrete on um, uh, uniaxial compression were carried out using the Kolsky uh, method with the split Hopkinson pressure bar. Uh, the experiments were carried out on uh, cylindrical samples of fine grain concrete mat matrix, uh, as well as with uh, addition um, of steel, polypropylene, fiber, and its uh, combination. Uh, the experimental setup consists of a gas gun of uh, 20 millimeters caliber uh, incident and transmitter bars with a diameter of 20 millimeters uh, and test sample between it. Uh, the registration of strains uh, pulses of measuring bars uh, was carried out using uh, strain uh, gauges uh, glued to its uh, lateral surface. The singles from strain gauges um, were transferred to a digital oscilloscope uh, for future processing. Uh, samples were made in form uh, cylinders, 20 millimeters in diameter and 10 millimeters in length for dynamic tests. Uh, diameter and length of the um, samples uh, were 20 millimeters for static tests. Uh, three to five samples uh, of each material were taken for static tests as well as for each uh, dynamic test mode. Uh, the speed of uh, the striker uh, was varied for obtaining uh, different stress rates modes in the experiments. Uh, the slide shows uh, the deformation diagrams of uh, the concrete matrix. Uh, mechanical properties obtained uh, uh, on the basis of 
uh, deformation diagrams uh, are uh, summarized uh, in table. Uh, similarly, static and dynamic diagrams uh, of deformation of concrete with uh, steel fiber were obtained, uh, which are presented to on this slide. Uh, deformation diagrams uh, and uh, strains properties of concrete with uh, polypropylene fiber uh, are shown on this slide. Uh, uh, deformation diagrams and the strains properties of concrete with uh, combination of steel and polypropylene fiber uh, fibers um, are also shown on this slide. Uh, it can be noted that um, uh, the deformation diagram of all investigated concretes have a, a similar form. But the values uh, of strengths with increase with um, which increase with increase of stress rate are different for various concrete. Uh, the obtained uh, experimental data were used to determine uh, the parameters of the Morozov Petrov strengths criterion uh, based on the concept of incubation time. Uh, the fracture uh, of the materials occurs when uh, condition number one uh, is satisfied uh, according to the special criterion. Uh, growth of uh, compression stress was assumed uh, to be linear uh, until moment of uh, fracture uh, for determining the incubation time. Uh, the observed uh, dynamic increase uh, in of strains of tested material was calculated uh, using incubation time criterion. Uh, the rate dependence of strains plotted on the basis of the um, uh, structural uh, time approach uh, are in good agreement with the experimental, uh, experimental data uh, for all tested materials. Uh, thus, the following conclusions can be made uh, according uh, to the results of the study. Uh, one, uh, Unixel static and dynamic compression tests were carried out for samples of uh, different types of fiber reinforced concrete and the uh, concrete matrix. The par parameters of the incubation fracture time criterion were determined for investigated materials on the basis, uh, on the basis of the experimental data. Uh, the obtained experimental resu uh, results are characterized by temperate uh, scatter and show the uh, influence of the stress rate on the mechanical properties uh, of tested materials. The maximum stresses increased with increasing stress rate for materials. Um, and um, it is shown that the time dependence of strengths uh, of investigated concretes in compression can be predicted by incubation time criterion. The rate dependencies of the material strengths um, predicted on the basis of the structural temporal approach uh, is in good agreement with the uh, experiment. Uh, uh, experiment. Uh, thank you for attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I have a fast uh, question. So it's for, in order to assess the incubation time, you were, take, you were take, taking compression stresses. Am I right? This is compression stresses. Compression stress. But we, uh, to uh, my, um, uh, up to my knowledge, uh, Morozov and uh, Petrov, they were talking about tension stresses and they were, uh, telling that it is un unlikely that uh, fracture can happen due to compression. 
Well, when you apply compression, there is always tension that is happening somewhere. And this is this tension that is causing fracture, not compression itself. Well, material has microstructure, you compress that, tension creates somewhere, and this is the reason for, for fracture. So I'm not, not sure how correct is that to put compression stress into the incubation time uh, criterion. But and anyway, uh, do we have uh, another questions? Questions from uh, online audience? If no, I may ask another question. So it's uh, based on your research. If I want to construct a house, so which uh, which uh, concrete is uh, better? Should I add this plastic fibers or metal fibers or a combination? So what is actually better for? Sorry. Uh... I bet uh, understand in English by air. Uh, repeat uh, uh, your answer in Russian, please. Uh, если uh, е, uh, какой материал uh, лучше для того, чтобы сооружать какие-то конструкции, бетон с вот этими с пластиковыми uh, фибрами, с металлическими или или комбинация. И может быть вы еще можете прокомментировать что-то о, о том о, о влиянии да, на, на свойства вот именно отдельно пластика, отдельно металлических волокон. Uh, yes, um, uh, uh, but um, uh, this material is um, with steel fiber. Steel fiber is um, uh, very well for dynamic and static loading. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So we should add metallic fibers to con concretes. Uh, do we have more questions? Can you bring the Maybe there are any more questions. Not really. Well, if not, then uh, we thank uh, we thank the presenter once again. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, the next presentation is again from uh, from Italy, from uh, the University of uh, Modena and Reggio Emilia. And the uh, talk will be uh, given by uh, Dr. Falope. And the title is on the anti-plastic bending of uh, solids at infinite. Strains. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon. Here's your 20 minutes. Okay. Thanks. So thanks for the introduction. So today I'm here. To, I'm here to, to show you the, how our model regarding the finite bending of a solid in uh, the framework of the finite elasticity. So this is uh, a brief summary of uh, my presentation. Our presentation. I am going to show you the, the fundamentals of the analytic model of uh, pool bending, uniform bending of uh, rectangular solid, uh, so in the thicker elastic and compressible material, then followed by uh, just some brief uh, sketch on the experimental test performed by us, uh, and followed by the numerical model in terms of financial element simulation, then results and conclusions. So let me start with the theoretical model. How the bending is prescribed on the solid? So the bending is prescribed presentation sorry we see you but we do not see your presentation okay, sorry sorry you, you yeah. see it now can you see that okay so the, so the solids now this the the banding is prescribed at, uh, at the solid throughout the prescribed angle rotation of the final cross section of the solid so the here indicated with the red color alpha note or equivalent R note. Alpha note is the relative rotation between the final cross section of the solid, while R note, that is the inversion proportional to the, to the alpha note angles, represent R note, the longitudinal radius of curvature of the solid. So here in this slide, you can observe the four fundamental main assumptions of the model. The first main assumption is that the longitudinal fiber of the solid Mean, longitudinal means directed along the zeta axis uh, and the transversal uh, fibers of the solid and transversal means that the, the PRX directed uh, 
after deformation, after bending, the form into arc of arcs of circumference. So, the transversal arc of circumference is characterized by the, by a positive uh, positive curvature that is uh, typically known as the antiplastic curvature, and is this one, while the longitudinal one has a negative curvature. So, the merging between this kind of curvature generates a 3D surface that in literature is known as the antiplastic surface. Surface. This is the first main assumption of the model. While the second assumption is a plain cross section cross section conservation, where cross section belong to the XY plane, and this is well known in the engineering formulation as the more sophisticated mathematician one, as uh, the Euler Bernoulli beam assumption. Third assumption is that each cross section of the solid behaves in the same way. What does it mean behaves? It means that we behave that all cross section because of uniform bending with cost of the radius of curvature, the form in the same way. Whilst the last assumption of the, the final assumption of the model, the first one, is that um, transversally we have the correspondence between the principal stresses. And this assumption is required to close the solvent and close the problem and reach the closure of the problem. So this is the fundamental geometric model of the problem in which in figure A you can observe the longitudinal behavior of the solid at this, that's this one, in the Y and Z plane, whilst in figure C you can observe the deformed cross-section of the solid. So we assume now that this model can be generate, generalized to other cross-section. In this model we have considered angular cross-section that once the deformation uh, arises, it's, it's the form into an uh, into a sector of circular chrome, as reported in people seen this slide. Then, uh, the, from from the cinematic previously introduced in uh, this slide, from the cinematic we can compose that uh, the displacement field vector of the solid, in which we can observe the right quantity that are the cinematic unknown of the problem. So. What is uh, the, which are the kinematic unknown of the problem? When and who is when? When is the, is the position, is the coordinate along the y axis of the longitudinal fiber of the solid that is unstressed in terms of transversal deformation, whilst minus r and capital R are respectively its own transversal and longitudinal radius of curvature. So when the displacement field is achieved throughout the, oper the gradient operator, so the displacement gradient superposed with the length tensor can obtain the deformation gradient, and then the related amount uh, related to the deformation. Then from this amount, in particular, I'm referring to the left or right we see the formation tensor, we can obtain the principal stretches of the solids and from um, that contain the unknown to N, capital R, and uh, minus R of the solid. Then, from the cinematic treatment, we can move to our the proper constitutive law that is assumed for us as a, as a general constitutive law valid for uh, any kind of compressible and hyperelastic material defined as a function of the deformation invariant. So, when the cinematic is known throughout the constitutive law, we can obtain the viola curve of stress tensor that is indicated in this slide, in this slide at, uh, as a TR, that can obtain throughout the previously introduced cinematics as the combination between a rigid rotation tensor, so an orthogonal tensor, that acts on TB, the TB tensor. The TB tensor is the bio stress tensor that is uh, defined that is defined as the symmetric part of the viola kirchhoff stress tensor, and the viola stress tensor is a diagonal, uh, diagonal tensor, which Hagen values are, the, are clearly the principal stress of this tensor, and here indicated as TB1 and TB3 that are function of the, of the compressible law of the, of the store energy density function, and as a function of the principal stresses of this in the solid. When the, when the stress measure are known in the reference configuration from our cinematic, is, it's, it's extremely simple to move to the, the from, uh, from the reference to the deformed configuration throughout the Cauchy stress tensor that is related to the um, principal component of the your stress tensor in the same way the principal stretches of, the, of, our, of our model. 
So then we, we have to solve the, the, the problem by the imposition of uh, the equilibrium equation. And uh, we impose uh, the equilibrium equation in the weak form, so in approximated form, and the locally. So the equilibrium equation in terms of divergence of the Euler curve of stress tensor is not globally imposed, but is imposed in approximate form on the longitudinal basic line of the solid that is the line transversely is unstretched. This is the first equation to solve the system because the other two components of the divergence of the Euler curve of stress tensor are automatically fulfilled while uh, the second equation is achieved by imposing the vanishing of the circuitry of the bundle of the solid in the spirit of the sum Bernal principle. Then we impose a we assume a compressible moon for energy density function, defined as you can see in the slide, and define and uh, achieve properly the the viola curve of stress tensor as the differentiation of the solar energy function with respect to the deformation tensor that is at capital F. And then this is, the, is the, the closure of the problem. This, three, this system in three coupled equation, in which the first equation represents the divergence, the only, the only remaining divergence, the equation of the divergence of the relative of stress tensor. The second equation represents the vanishing of the circuit on the mantle of the solid. And the third equation represents uh, is achieved by a kinematic consideration regarding the distribution of the transversal principal stress across the eight of the solid. So these three equations, this system of equation represents the closure of the problem. When this system of equation is solved and the kinematic unknown are, are achieved, we can uh, depict, as uh, shown in uh, this slide, the form, the form the configuration of the solid and also describe the principal stress inside the cross-section of the solid. What is interesting about this moment that this, this model can uh, allow to, to achieve and define the bending moments for battery relation. We define the bending, the bending moment as the first moment resultant of the longitudinal stresses uh, weighted with respect to the eight, the, the variable that uh, is along the edge of the solids. And then we can uh, reduce, uh, maybe we can introduce the beam approximation by impose the vanishing of the one parameter and the corresponding between the anticlastic radius of the longitudinal uh, unstretched fiber and the barycentric fiber. This approximation allow us to define the, um, the equivalent linearized elastic modulus of a moon material, that are the young modulus and the Poisson ratio of a moon material, and then by the introduction of the bending moment for battery relation, we can dimensionalize the problem and what can we observe throughout the, dim the dimensionalization of the problem. We can observe that the bending moment carries, can express in, as a function of two dimensionless parameters that, in beta, that are beta ES and beta C called the, the Eulerian slenderness and the compactness index. It's curious to observe in the Eulerian slenderness that R0 is the longitudinal radius of curvature. So this is a kinematic parameter that belongs to the deformed configuration. So it, it's an unknown of the problem. And then the dimensionless bending moment here denoted with M over line X as a function of beta ES can be expressed in terms of an exact solution that can be expanded in the series with respect to the beta yes parameter and what we can observe that is that the leading order term in this expansion exactly represented the Euler's elastic equation in terms of bending moment in some of course group. Then we have uh, specifically designed this kind of uh, experimental device to prescribe the poor bending that is based on a pantograph system that throughout the, uh, throughout the rotation of an activator angle is such to induce the motion between an upper guide and lower guide that uh, are approaching and induce the poor bending of a rubber specimen that is blue between the pantograph device and here they noted with a uh, red color. Then we have also a higher displacement field during the experimental test with, uh, with the optical monitoring of the PLC technologies for, for the comparison with the finite element model uh, and uh, with, uh, with experiment. So we, then we have a comparison between the experimental results, uh, the finite element model for the supporting of the theoretical formulation. So for this is the result. This result shows that the longitudinal at the figure on our left, the longitudinal radius of curvature 
has a variation that is approximately the constants along the zeta variable of the solid, and this supports our main assumption of the model, so constant values of the overshoot of the solid. And in this figure, you can observe with a continuous line iterates per result, with dashed line, the finance element simulation, and in terms of this great point, the experimental results. So this is the last one of the last slide in, in which we have supported also the clean cross-section conservation. You can see from the control plot that the cross-section rotates and maintains planar during the deformation of the solid. So as a conclusion, with the experimental with the experimental test and supported also with the finance element simulation. We have, uh, we have uh, found the reliability of the model assumption, in particular of the term of uh, a constant radius of curvature, with constant trend, uh, both uh, longitudinal and anti plastic radius, and also the capability of the model to grasp the anti plastic profile of, uh, of the solid. Unfortunately, we, we observe that friction inside the guides is such to induce a not so good result when the deformation becomes extremely large, but extremely large the deformation is closer to the compenetration of the final cross-section, final cross-section of the beam. In terms of future development, we try we have tried to release some assumption of the model to extend this model to shell elements, a investigation of different constitutive law and also provide the experimental uh, device to of, of a load set because during the experimental device we have only be able to be to measure only schematic parameter by not the kind that uh, that the responsible thanks for your attention yeah thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation uh, can you reverse a couple of slides where, where you have a comparison between uh, between uh, new yeah yeah this uh, slide so it's I'm not sure I understand that uh, correctly so the solid line is uh, okay. Here, here the solid line, we have the theoretical variation of the anticlastic radius across uh, the, the longitudinal axis of the solid. So in our model, the, the bending is uniform bending, so the, anti, the, the longitudinal radius is constant. And here you can observe that the continuous line, that is the theoretical one, is perfectly constant. Whilst the finite element simulation, the trend is constant, but not at the final cross-section of the solid ball, because uh, constraint because the restraint induced in the finite element simulation, no? And uh, the second point is that you can observe in terms of point, discrete point, the experimental result. When the experimental, when the prescribed rotation angle are small, the relative error are, uh, are lower, are lower. But this is due to the fact that uh, we have a friction inside the guides on the experimental device. And, and on, on the left side, you have the longitudinal radius of Kubatu, while in the same way, on the right slide, we have the transversal one, so that is the anti plastic, all right? Okay, but anyway, the comparison is not looking really convincing. <laughs> you could also maybe compare to simpler theories, like, I don't know, to oil uh, Bernoulli or the Mashenka beams, so it's just to yeah. show. The yeah, but, 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 but that one, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not, not longer valid in the framework of a large deformation. So when here we have alpha naught equal to 66 degree, that means that in total the, the relative rotation between the final cross-section is twice. So it's 120 degree about. So we have a large deformation regime. I see. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Questions? Any questions from online participants? Okay, not uh, not really. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Federico again. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, presenter is from uh, India. Do we have a? Uh, do we have uh, Santano? Santano Manta? Yes, 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 I'm here. Thank Hello, you. happy to see you. Uh, what is uh, the weather at your city at Indoor right now? Yeah, I'm in, at Indoor. Thank you, Valdemir. What is uh, the temperature? I'm asking because. Uh, yeah, yeah, here it is around you know, 26 to 28. 
26 to 20. We have 34 right now. Yeah, we are cooler now. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. well, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to uh, present uh, Professor Santanu Manu from uh, India, Indian Institute of Technology in Indo. And uh, the title of his presentation is Impact on the Dispersive Wave Due to Impulsive Point Source at the Interface of Anisotropic Poroelastic Layer and Non-Homogeneous Infinite Extent Medium. Quite a long uh, title. You have 20 minutes for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. I'm extremely sorry that I could not present you uh, this time at uh, Russia, the last time I was there. So anyway, um, I will uh, talk a little bit, uh, you know, more about Indore because uh, I mean, I, I, I am sure that most of the people don't know about Indore. Uh, Baldimir, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so this is actually in the central part of India. You know, this is the locations and it's a very beautiful city. So a lot of things are there inside the city. So if anyone wants to visit India, you must uh, you must visit at Indore. It's the central part of uh, you know India. Okay. Anyway, for today's presentations, I am going to talk about the surface wave scattering uh, due to impulsive point source. So uh, surface wave scattering means we are going to study about the seismic surface wave. So if you think about the uh, wave propagations, seismic wave propagations in a layer media that can be divided into two parts majorly. One is the body wave, another one is the surface wave, right? So if you think about the seismic wave, so it will generally propagate in the lithosphere. Like if you think about from the surface to the 20 kilometer day, generally you will get the kind of seismic wave. Okay, Professor Novil already discussed about the uh, lab wave propagation. Right. So I will talk about the lab type wave surface seismic wave propagations over here in this topic. Right. So first of all, we will <coughs> discuss about the statement of the problem, how we will uh, formulate the problem, and then we will discuss about the methodology of the problem, and then we will go for the uh, details about the distortion equations on that model. And we will also go for the validations of the result, whatever the lab type wave we will get, this portion wave we will get there, that we will go for the validation of the result, then we will go for testing the attribution analysis of the dispersion wave, and the error analysis of the phase velocity, then numerical discussion and conclusion. Okay. So this is, I already uh, talked about that, that if you think about the surface wave, which generally propagate from the sun near to the surface of the earth, like if you think about the lithosphere, generally somewhere near to the surface, the earthquake will be propagated and the body will be going inside, surface wave will come in the near to the surface, right? So this is some kind of example that I told you that uh, surface wave generally can be studied to understand the interior structure of the earth. If you propagate the surface wave in a medium, so we can study the about the particle motions about the structure by moving of the nature of the wave from the layered medium. Some kind of other mechanical, like you know, the uh, surface wave kind of lateral wave, la wave, these are the mechanical waves. So this wave can also be studied in kind of some compost, composite structure material, which is generally used in kind of smart, smart card, flight structure, heavy light composite structure material. This is one kind of one example. So now this is the model that we, uh, formulate it from the earth layer media, which is going to study the surface wave propagations. So we have taken one point source at the interface between a anisotropic homogeneous porous medium and a non-homogeneous elastic of space, or you can say it is extended media. But another one thing is that we have studied in our study that we have taken some kind of coated layer over the porous media. And we also compare when we have removed the coated layer. That's a very thin coated layer we have taken in the small L. And then if we remove the coated layer, what kind of uh, nature is going to change of the surface? So here, the equation of motion we derive for the case of the surface wave propagation in a uh, layered media by using the second law of motions. So which are taking the forces is equal to mass into accelerations. So, and this is the extra term we are taking in the form of the 
point source in the layered media. Okay, where uh, uh, tau i is a we are uh, sigma i is a we are representing here the stress component, and f is the forces at the points which is located over here, and rho is the density of the medium. The density of the different medium will be different. We are going to derive the equation of motions for three different medium uh, separately, and then we'll combine some kind of boundary uh, conditions to compile all of this equation of motion. And then we'll go for some kind of uh, method which will be handled by this kind of problem due to the force distance density distribution functions involved in the equation of motion. Now, uh, these things already discussed uh, by Professor Noville that uh, if we take a lab type, lab kind of lab type wave or lab wave propagation in a linear layer media, so generally you can see that in a, in a, in a, any wave propagations in a layered media, if you think about the mechanical wave propagations, there are two kind of uh, particle motions we generally found. One is called the um, uh, uh, transverse wave propagations, and another one is called the uh, uh, composite wave propagation. Like one uh, which has a particle motions will be perpendicular to the direction of the propagations of the wave, and another one wave propagations with the particle motions will be kind of elliptic shape. For example, if you think about the railway wave, the particles and particle motions for the case of the railway will take in the form of the elliptic say, say. But here we are going to study the lab wave propagations, which has a transverse wave motions of the particle. Okay. And if we introduce those uh, conditions to our equation of motions, whatever we are taken for the case of the finite thickness coated layer, that will get a simple, uh, simple equation of motions where rigidity and density for that layer, layer media we consider as a mu one and rho one so similarly if we set up the equation of motion for the case of the intermediate uh, anisotropic uh, homogeneous uh, fluid saturated cross medium that equation and, and, and if we involve the law wave uh, conditions involved in that uh, layer media then the uh, system of equations which is on the three directions that will be Come in the form of the single dispersion, uh, single equation of motions in the form in, in the form of the uh, different uh, density uh, functions of fluid, porous, and uh, uh, solid uh, things. Right. So here we are taking the relations between the uh, mass uh, coefficient and mass uh, density in the layer media involved in this medium. Now, if we combine all of these things then we will get a such simple equations uh, that will deal uh, so first of all we are set up in, we are collecting the equation of motions which we will getting from the layered media right so this is for the second layered media now if we go for the third layered media where uh, okay this was the compilations of the earlier equation of whatever the equations we take it from the case of the uh, middle layered media that compilations is coming in the form of these equations right equation six where if d is a uh, is the porosity uh, parameter where this d if the d1 values is uh, this is the dimensionless parameter of the porosity if it is going to be uh, near to zero then we can say that uh, the medium is a non porous solid medium if it is tending to zero then you can say it is a uh, fluid medium and if it is if the medium in between zero and one then you can say it is a fluid saturated porous medium now, if we uh, introduce some kind of heterogeneity medium, heterogeneity in the lower half space, or you can say in the expanded medium, that rigidity, uh, uh, non homogeneity, or heterogeneity we are taking in the form of the uh, rigidity and density. Okay, where we are taking in the exponential form, or we are considering here in the exponential form of the, uh, the, with the rigidity and density, which is inversely proportional to the depth. Uh, the non-homogeneity condition, a uh, constant. And if we substitute all these things to that equation, so, so then it will take finally this equation's form. Now, uh, for the solution purpose, if, uh, for the solution purpose, we are uh, taking some kind of uh, harmonic uh, solutions for the wave propagation. So, where V, uh, J, X, X1, X3, and T, which will be taking in the form of the uh, Vj we are taking in the form of x1 and x3 and the time we are taking in the form of the exponential right so uh, 
for the for the force distri distribution de density distribution function we are taking the same things as the uh, r we are taking in the form of the pi functions and the time we are taking in exponential and omega is obviously an angular frequency which is in the form of the wave number and phase velocity now if you introduce these equations to our earlier uh, three equation of motions for the three layer media then we will get some set of equations and also we are expressing this phi in the form of the direct delta functions like this so if you introduce all those things in the above three layer media then finally we are taking a simple system of equations for the model which is giving in the equations 10 11 and 12 now this set of equations we need to go for uh, getting the solutions or how to handle this kind of equations. So the next thing is we are going to, uh, so this is the simple form we have taken by applying the linear transform because here uh, the variable functions was in the form of the x1 and x3, so which is in the partial differential equation form. Now we apply the linear transform and the equations is getting uh, as ordinary system of equations, ordinary differential equations. Now, uh, so this was the uh, things whatever we have taken here, like pi, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, that has been presented over here. Now, if we uh, introduce the boundary conditions, uh, so at the free surface, up of the coated layer, our stress component is zero, there is no load. But if we take the interface between the uh, two layers, the two interfaces at the between the two we have taken the plane surface, the stresses and the displacement are continuous there. So, uh, we are taking the continuity conditions uh, of the displacement and continuity conditions of the stresses at the layer of a L, uh, at the layer of, uh, you know, the homogeneous solar layer and the porous media, and at the layer of the porous media and uh, the heterogeneity of space. So now if you introduce these boundary conditions to our system of equations, that system of equations cannot be solved because of the density distribution functions involved there in the equation. So we need to take something uh, called a green function approach we applied over here of the system. And then green uh, functions approach will give you the set of solutions for the case of this side by using the properties of the green functions which will satisfy equation number 14, which is getting from here. From here. So now uh, similarly, we will do some kind of uh, manipulations of the solutions to get the simple form of the V1 because we are trying to get the displacement in all the layered media for this case. Okay. So, here actually, by using the uh, green function technique and applying the properties of the green function technique, we are trying to get the V2. And then, similarly, the same approach we apply for the another, another set of equations which is given in equation number, I think, 15. Okay, the same approach we applied over here to get the V3. And V1 we can already can get from the earlier because the this force uh, density distribution function is not involved there in the layer of the oh, excuse, can you, can you yes. try to reposition your microphone? Sometimes we hear you re really well, but sometimes you disappear. Okay, okay. Yeah, now is it okay? Yeah, now it's perfect. Thank okay, you. okay, thank you. Okay. So now, I mean, we are just uh, compiling all the boundary conditions and the system of equations after after applying the green function technique. Uh, we are compiling those things. It's, it's a very long calculation. I'm not going to show those things. Finally, we are getting uh, the dispersion equations, which is in the form of, uh, I think uh, this is the, the dispersion. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the dispersion equations. Finally, we are getting for the layered media, right? So this dispersion equations is the dispersion equations which will be derived from the layered media by applying the green function technique and applying the boundary conditions involved in the model. Now, to check the validity of the model, if we take the uh, lower half space is a homogeneous medium, that means we are taking that epsilon is equal to zero. Epsilon component contains the, uh, that uh, A1, A2, A3, all of the heterogeneity parameters. If you make this epsilon equal to zero, then the lower half space completely is going to be a homogeneous half space. And then the next case, if we involve that, if you neglect the intermediate medium, so we are taking a finite thickness layer or a half space. In that case, for the case of the homogeneous isotopic medium, our equation of motion is taking in the form of the original now wave equations, which is derived by the AAC lab in 1911. 
right so similarly in the next case if we just neglect the coated layer above coated layer and taking the homogeneous and non homogeneous half space then in that case also our uh, uh, this uh, equation original equation of motion is taking in the form of the original lavo equations uh, derived by the ag lab so this was the validations of the model that okay whatever the model uh, derivations we did so by using their concept we are getting the uh, same result uh, same result which has been derived by the earlier researcher now uh, we know that for surface for lossy uh, layered surface media we are taking the complex uh, the wave number is a complex quantity so if we take the wave number is a complex quantity so then this wave number can be uh, written in the form of the attenuation functions this is the attenuation term now change depending on the attenuation term we can go for the corrections of the phase velocity right so if we take the if we apply the wave number over here in the dispersion then the dispersion equation taking in two part one is the real dispersion equations another one is the imaginary dispersion equations now the imaginary part of the dispersion equations is giving a damping of the phase velocity that is the generated by that the damping of the phase velocity which contain the or uh, uh, dispersion equations as well as the damping term now if we take the error analysis of the phase velocity which is the original dispersion equations and the real part of the uh, phase velocity the dispersion equations by applying the attenuation coefficient then we can see that by changing the attenuation coefficient we can uh, go for the error uh, equations of the phase velocity so here you can see that in this graph with the red one we have taken the phase velocity with damping that is the original dispersion equations whatever we derive and after that after after getting the uh, after removing the damping term from the phase velocity we got this one so here if we check the error analysis so we can check that the for the large uh, phase velocity once we are taking the phase velocity is increasing large phase velocity we are our uh, error is going to less right our absolute error is going to less so in case of the low phase velocity the error is going to increase or this case so in that way so attenuation coefficients is one who can improve the accuracy of the phase velocity speed now if we that like that as i told you that akin a damping velocity will help you to decrease the phase velocity in the layered media so that's why we are trying to give a, a clear picture that how the nature of the damping of the phase velocity will be in that layered media and how the original phase velocity or uh, i mean the corrected phase velocity will be in the layered media okay so then we go for the calculations of the group velocity you know that in a, in a dispersive wave that is for a a different frequency component in a single form of a group velocity and if this group velocity have uh, properties of a different speed uh, 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 is is propagated in a different uh, speed and different medium then it is called a, it is a, it's a kind of group velocity right for the non dispersive equations uh, for the non dispersive wave the group velocity and phase velocity in the medium are same right so here we are derive the group velocity in the form uh, from the dispersion equations in the form of the phase velocity now uh, for the numerical uh, simulations we apply some kind of rigidity and density which is given in this paper we have considered the rigidity and density and then if we uh, use those kind of parameter we have given some kind of table of the uh, image whatever we used over here then we can see that this image actually we call we calculate it if we take a coated layer and uncoated layer in the model right the red color curve is showing in case of the coated layer over the uh, finite thickness layer the porous medium and if we take the uncoated layer we can see that the phase velocity is a non dispersive after the uh, after, after the layer because in the we you know the seismic surface wave only dispersive if some medium are there okay so here if we take some kind of medium uh, then it can be dispersive now this curve also we represent in in case of the anisotropic porous medium and the isotropic porous medium in the layer medium so the uh, nature of the curve uh, how they are propagating in a, in a cross uh, anisotropic cross media and uh, non anis uh, and, 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 and isotropic cross media that has been shown in this figure and uh, this uh, representations of the curve you can see that this is actually 
we calculated for the porous medium once the porosity parameters in tending to the porous things like it is once the porosity parameter in between 0 and 1 once the porosity parameter tends to the uh, fluid saturated medium and once uh, the porous medium porosity parameter is tending to the solid medium so here the uh, the uh, 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 the red color which we can see that this is actually the dispersive wave in a porous medium but once we can see the <coughs> non dispersive non uh, non porous solid medium our dispersive equations is going to be no uh, uh, <coughs> more uh, non uh, in, in in terms of the non dispersive in terms of the more uh, non dispersive okay so then uh, we go for a <coughs> homogeneous and non homogeneous uh, dispersive uh, layered media of the phase velocity so this red black color is showing that once the lower half space is homogeneous so you cannot find any uh, dis di uh, any dispersions of the homogeneous layered media for this case for this type of uh, model but if we take some kind of non homogeneity parameter inside the uh, half space we can find the uh, dispersion and the changing of the nature of the curve with the changing of the uh, non homogeneity parameter in the involved in the layered media so uh, this is the same way once we go for the increasing order of the uh, heterogeneity parameter and decreasing order of the heterogeneity parameter how their nature is going to be changed that has been shown from this uh, graph uh, and this is this figure actually giving the different uh, density parameter involved in the layered media and uh, this velocity we are taking in the form of the wave number uh, and if we see that if we increase the the density parameter in the layered media, the phase velocity also going to increase. Okay, and if we decrease the phase velocity in the layered media, the phase velocity is going to decrease because of the coated layer on that uh, uh, medium. And the same thing also has been derived here uh, for the case of the phase velocity with respect to the density. But here we are taking the different or different or particular values of the uh, wave number. So earlier cases we are we vary the wave number, but here if we take some kind of fixed values of the wave number, then we can see that the phase velocity is decreasing for a particular values of the wave number with the increase of the uh, porosity parameter in the uh, intermediate layer media. So uh, this uh, figure actually we calculated if uh, we take a intermediate layer and if we neglect the intermediate layer. So the, this figure actually giving you that for once we have in the model the intermediate layer is present there, that means the coated layer are there, then intermediate gross medium is there, and then intermediate then the lower half space anisotropic non homogeneous medium are there. Right. So in that case, if we see that if this value, that means the uh, length of the layer media, that means if we change the length of the layer media, if we increase then we can see that the velocity is highly propagating and uh, the phase velocity is highly propagating uh, uh, in that medium. Okay, but in case of uh, non-porous medium, non-porous medium, we can see that they are uh, they are, they are uh, in the increasing of the phase velocity. Okay, two, two are, minutes left. We have yeah. Okay. 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 So this is actually uh, the group velocity uh, of the dispersive wave. Uh, we have formulated over here the group velocity is referred to the velocity of the energy task force which is the rate of the energy travel right so the amplitude of the velocity uh, in the in the form of the uh, energy task force in a non uh, in a non porous media is larger than the uh, energy task force in a fluid saturated press there so if you see the amplitude this is actually uh, the group velocity in case of the intermediate porous medium and in case of the non porous medium so we can see that the energy transport in the form of the amplitude for the case of the non porous medium is getting large than the uh, porous medium okay so these are the conclusions uh, from this study we understood that the phase velocity of the love wave love wave is a is a, uh, a is, is vary with the with the value of the wave number and it will be decreases with the increase of the uh, wave number as per the nature of the surface wave, surface wave propagation. 
and the dispersion of wave uh, increases with the increase of the non-homogeneity parameter in the half space. The scattering of the wave is stable in case of the homogeneous half space, but for the non-homogeneous half space, it is a the stability depending on the large values of the wave number. And the phase velocity will be increases its speed in, uh, for the homogeneous coated layer and decreases in case of the coated, uh, uncoated layer. And the speed of the phase velocity is more than the anisotropic porous medium rather than the isotopic medium. And the phase velocity in the porous medium is dominated by the same kind of fluid saturated, uh, fluid saturated porous medium. And the depending on the stability value uh, value of the attenuation coefficient, the error of the phase velocity can be reduced. Okay, these are the references and these are the my group at IIT Indore. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Santana. Uh, do I understand it right that you want to use this kind of theory for analysis of uh, of uh, waves in uh, in rocks with uh, filled with in porous rocks filled with oil, gas, and things like that? And so I couldn't get uh, what kind of theory you say, right? Are you going to use that for analysis of uh, propagation of waves in porous rock materials? For example, like shell, uh, yes, yes. filled with oil and gas. Yeah, see, actually our concentrate to make the model in such a way that the model which will be exist in lithosphere. Because we are going to take some kind of material where the earthquake source parameter will be involved there. Okay. So we generally go for finding the some material which is exist in the lithosphere, right? Some kind of you know that sometimes reinforced parameter also will be work. Reinforced media also will be work near to the surface. Some kind of porous media we can take. If we go for near to the surface, then we can take some kind of rock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for one question, maybe. Somebody from online audience. We have one question from Mriganka Chikar Chaki. Yeah, Mriganka, yeah, you can ask me this. Yeah, uh, hello, sir. How are you? Hi. I'm good. Yeah. How are you? Yes, fine. Uh, so, I have a question on uh, your geometry. Uh, the slide 6, uh, can you? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Of course, of course. Can you see my slide? Not yet. Yeah, this one, right. This one? I cannot see your slide. Okay, I see. I see. Don't see your slides, you see a picture. Yeah, now we do. Yeah, so uh, I understand this is a kind of a earth structure, right? Yes, yes. So that is very, uh, very particular, right? Because earth structure is much more complex than I think. Uh, you went to, I think, what is that, magma or something? You take a piece of that. No, actually, you see, yeah. no, 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 no. It is a mad, it is a made by, you know, Microsoft Word only. Okay. Because yes. what happened, this is actually layer structure. If you see the structure of the layer, there are three parts of there. In the end, you can get some kind of core. Okay. Don't think about the color. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Color you don't think about. Okay. So we are taking here, this is center. So you can take a core. Then you can take a mental, so upper mental, lower mental are there, right? Upper core, mayor, uh, lower core also there, and then the crustal layer are there. But if you think about the earthquake, then uh, uh, then you must have known that the crustal layer is generally from the surface to the 50 kilometer depth, right? Around 50 kilometer depth. And then the uh, uh, intermediate are the uh, mental are there, right? Intermediate. But if you see about the lithosphere, the lithosphere is taking from zero to uh, kind of 200 kilometer, but generally earthquake lo uh, uh, located, right? So we have taken the model over here. This is the half space. You don't uh, think about that because we are trying to try take the kind of uh, structure. So that's why I have given the different color over here, right? So it, it, it doesn't mean that that middle one is containing all the uh, mental layer, right? Yeah, but uh, as a suggestion, I, I think it will be better to just uh, take a small cut and just to show that cut uh, rather than the generalization of the uh, structure. So I think yeah. that's a suggestion that you can maybe look into it. Yeah, Thank that you. can be done. That can be done. But uh, in general, those who are not, uh, I mean, from this area, they will not understand from where they took this one. Right. 
so that's yes. why that's why we generally follow in such a way that that people will understood oh okay this is yeah this is actually earth we can write we can write down here this is the center is the core then entrance then the entrance then it can in that case it will be here for everyone yeah okay, okay. yeah thank you very much it's yeah thank you and if they present again uh, the next presenter is already on the uh, screen, so the next presentation is uh, to be given by uh, Mriganka Chaki, also from uh, India, from IIT Kanpur. And the title of the presentation is Surface Waves in Electroelastic Layered Structures with Imperfect Contact and Surface Stresses. Yeah, so the podium is yours, please use your 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Daniela and also everyone for inviting me uh, to this session. Uh, so my name is Mrigam Shekhar Chaki. I'm currently doing postdoc at uh, IIT Kanpur. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the surface waves in electroelastic layered or piezoelectric layered structure with imperfect contact and surface stresses. So uh, as per the keywords, uh, it is well known that uh, piezoelectricity is a very well known phenomena uh, where uh, we have uh, the, this kind of crystalline structure uh, having a non central symmetric uh, property, and uh, whenever we apply uh, stresses, uh, we see uh, some kind of uh, charges uh, form. And if you connect this battery, then we have this uh, electricity uh, on the electrical axis. So, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon is called direct piezoelectric effect. And if we see the reverse one, then we see that uh, it's called the inverse piezoelectric effect. For example, you see a quartz that is a silicon dioxide here. We see the arrangement of the uh, silicon and the oxygen molecules in the hexagonal uh, crystal structure. And if we try to compress or expand it, uh, then we see then on the electric acid charges are formed. So as for the motivation of the uh, uh, present uh, model, uh, we look into some of the surface acoustic wave devices. Thanks to Professor Novili and uh, my previous speakers, uh, we know uh, the definition of love wave and Rayleigh wave and other uh, seismic or acoustic waves. So, uh, in particular, I would like to uh, mention the four devices of the surface acoustic wave devices. And uh, uh, here we discuss the love wave biosensors. So, in such structure, which is a layered structure, we have the piezoelectric substrate, and there's some sort of guiding layer in, in the situation. So, in saw devices, normally we don't have the guiding layer, but in biosensors, we do have the guiding, guiding layer for which love wave is possible because the love wave needs a superficial layer to propagate. Now, in biosensor, we also have a liquid environment. And uh, if we discuss Rayleigh wave or Lamb wave or any other type of wave, then we see that uh, uh, the, these, uh, these waves uh, have a, a strong radiation loss into the liquid environment. Uh, since we are talking about only love wave, and love wave do not propagate in liquid environment, so we are only considering the solid structure here. So motivated by uh, uh, more information uh, can be found on the in, in class at all uh, book. And uh, motivated by this type of structure, uh, we see that uh, uh, we, we are considering uh, two types of uh, model here. A model one uh, will be consisting of a piezoelectric substrate. And at the surface, we have the surface elasticity, which we will talk later. And uh, another model we will consider uh, that is uh, having a two piezoelectric substrate. And the contact uh, is weak, that is uh, non-perfect bonding or imperfect bondings there. And we also have an interfacial elasticity. So let's. Let's talk about uh, surface elasticity. Uh, what is surface elasticity? It's, it's a, it's a, uh, this, this can be understood as a surface tension or, uh, or material boundary uh, for, us, uh, for the solid uh, uh, structures. Uh, on, uh, this can be interpreted as a pre-stretch elastic membrane, which is perfectly bonded to uh, a, a, surface, a surface of uh, elastic core. Uh, Brutin Murdoch approach or the Stagman organ approach is very much uh, uh, popular for this kind of uh, uh, structure modeling. And uh, we see that, uh, especially in Stagman organ, uh, has given us a, a way to uh, define uh, this uh, equation of motion and the boundary condition using Hamiltonian principle of least action, uh, for which we can uh, have the uh, complete mathematical modeling interpreting this uh, surface elastic. So uh, uh, based on this GM model, we have uh, the surface strain energy density, uh, surface uh, stress, uh, surface stresses, surface strains, and as well as kinetic energy. So last year, I have published a paper uh, with uh, uh, Professor Victor Edimayev, uh, where we have considered uh, uh, this uh, GM model, and we uh, applied it on the micropolar structure, and we have seen that uh, some interesting phenomena there. 
So we are applying the GM model into a piezoelectric uh, structure. So uh, for starter, uh, uh, we are uh, considering uh, the running equation. It is well known that uh, for transverse elastotropic piezoelectric medium, if you consider the z axis being the polling direction, then we have uh, this uh, constitutive equation. And uh, other than the Maxwell's uh, equation, we have uh, uh, this uh, coupled uh, equation of motion. Now, the complete model can uh, can be derived uh, where where we need to uh, uh, we need to consider this surface elasticity. So uh, we can use this uh, Hamilton piezoelectric or least action. So our model, the first one, is the piezoelectric substrate where on the top of the free surface we have surface elasticity. Obviously, we will talk about uh, different electric boundary condition the free surface. So here, uh, first we will not uh, propagate the love wave. We just propagate anti plane wave. And it is to be known that uh, if we have uh, this kind of uh, substrate and if it is simply isotropic elastic, then uh, love wave is not uh, uh, do, do not propagate. But if we consider only piezoelectric substrate, uh, anti-plane wave uh, to propagate, which is called a blister angular wave. And uh, but in this case, we are considering surface elastic. And Professor Edimai uh, already uh, proven that uh, if you consider an uh, if you consider isotropic uh, substrate as surface elastic in love wave. It is possible to have an anti-plane wave, and uh, which is uh, very much having a resemblance to the love wave. Now uh, we are considering only anti-plane wave in this situation, and uh, we will see what happened. So in this case, we have an equation of motion, which is a couple system again, and the boundary condition. Now the boundary condition, the first one that is the mechanical boundary condition at the free surface, we have uh, equation five, which is uh, where the right hand side is the surface elasticity, and the electric boundary condition uh, we have split into two. Uh, cases that is unelectrodate or electrodate because we are considering this thin uh, film as an electrode which could be grounded or not. So, in that case, we have uh, either the potential is zero or the electric displacement. Uh, apart from that, we have a radiation condition uh, where uh, along the depth uh, everything gets managed. So, uh, in such uh, scenario, as uh, Professor Marna has explained, that this type of uh, cases we have to assume a solution first with uh, arbitrary coefficients. So uh, since it's the half space problem, so we have uh, we have considered a positive term in the exponential uh, part and uh, uh, for the displacement and as well as, as well as for the potential, and this part is repeated because it's a couple system. Now uh, for the unelectrodate case, that is the boundary condition one and two gives us this dispersion relation, and for the electrodate case, that is uh, boundary condition one and three gives us this dispersion relation. And both this uh, dispersion relations. Uh, satisfy the wave propagation condition, and we can see that this uh, boundary condition is very similar to love wave propagation. Another approach uh, that we can uh, discuss is how to interpret such uh, GM model structure, how to interpret, how to uh, get this kind of uh, uh, dispersion equation. And uh, Fan and Zhu uh, gave us uh, a way to do that, uh, and they have considered uh, a couple stress theory on the top of the uh, substrate, the couple stress layer. So instead of that, we are considering an isotropic layer, and uh, we will uh, see that uh, it, it will uh, it will uh, be uh, giving us an exact uh, dispersion equation if you squeeze down the layer into an infinitesimally thin film. So for the layer half space problem, we have an equation of motion. We can uh, derive the boundary condition. For the solution of the layer, we can consider a sinusoidal uh, one, and for the half space, we can consider uh, exponential. So uh, using the boundary condition, we uh, derive the dispersion equation, which is very similar to love wave propagation. And if, if we take the layer weight, that is h, tends to 0, uh, not exactly 0, it tends to 0, then we see that uh, the dispersion equation uh, gets reduced to equation 16, which is exactly what we achieved in GM model. So we can uh, compare these two results. Uh, so uh, for neural analysis, uh, let's take a uh, material, uh, say pcd 5 h for the piezoelectric substrate. And if we, if we compare uh, surface elasticity of the membrane film as a gold membrane or aluminum membrane, uh, then first we consider gold membrane. And uh, we see that uh, for the omega versus k curve, we have a cut on frequency that is the blue curve, and the green curve as the cut off frequency. And uh, this black uh, curve is the dispersion uh, for the GM model, and the red one is for the layer of this model, where the layer width has been considered as 0.05. If we increase this layer uh, width, then we see that uh, the other vibrational modes are coming into the picture. 
So if we uh, if we again squeeze it down, then we see that it is uh, only uh, converting into a fundamental uh, vibrational modes, and eventually it will emerge with the geo. And same thing can happen for the uh, phase velocity uh, dispersion equation. So we see that uh, we have uh, we have considered gold membrane in this case. So for the gold membrane, the value of this P is that is the bulk velocity for the surface uh, elasticity uh, is, is lesser than the uh, CP, which is the bulk velocity of the substrate, which is satisfying the weight propagation condition. Now, if you consider, if you compare this gold membrane and aluminum membrane, you see that for the gold membrane, the electroded and unelectroded cases, we have the very nice dispersion relation. But uh, if you consider aluminum, you see that CS value is much larger than that. So this uh, condition is not satisfied. This inequality does not transfer. It's wrong in inequality. So we see that the speed is curved. So from now on, we will consider only gold membrane. For the model two, we consider two pieces of substrate, and we consider the contact is non-perfect, and we also considering uh, interfacial elasticity. Now. Uh, in the GM model, uh, consideration of this non-perfect uh, interface is very difficult. Uh, Professor Erima has, has given a solution to that. Uh, we uh, modify the strain energy, the surface strain energy, uh, like in this equation, where this K and K bars, the second order tensor and fourth order tensor, as, uh, is uh, associated with the uh, jump in the uh, uh, displacement component and the jump in energy. And uh, this K is also uh, is very similar to the uh, Winkler uh, elastic foundation, which is basically a shear lag or spring model. And K bar is uh, very similar to a uh, stimulus in the uh, pastor magnet foundation. So, and the, also the uh, uh, surface, uh, kinetic, uh, surface kinetic energy density is also changed because of the two substrate uh, involvement. So, again, we take the help of uh, action function and the Hamilton matrix of this section, uh, where uh, these parts represent the uh, uh, you know, this part depends on the interface and the surface, uh, and uh, we, op we obtain the equation of motion at 17 and 18 along with the boundary condition that is 19, uh, which is the mechanical boundary condition. Now, at the interface, we have uh, this mechanical boundary condition, and for the again for the electro uh, electrical boundary condition, we split it into two parts that is unelectrode and electro. On unelectrode case, we have the electric displacement continuity, and uh, electric displacement is balanced by the jump. Uh, in the potential function, but this K phi represents the imperfect bonding parameter, electric imperfect bonding parameter. And for the electrode, uh, electrode case, uh, all the phis are And again, we have the radiation condition like before. Again, the solution uh, methodology for uh, model two, we, uh, we consider uh, like very uh, like in the previous model, uh, we consider uh, exponential term for the uh, for the upper, so this is positive, and we have a lower, this is negative, and uh, uh, for the unelectroded case, that is, uh, uh, that is the uh, equation one and uh, two, uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, dispersion equation, where we see that uh, the wave propagation condition is this one, uh, and uh, it is to be noted that uh, this K phi term that disappears if you consider the both piezoelectric material uh, is thin. If there is a difference, then if the, these materials are different, then we have uh, this K phi. Uh, this K phi exists. And for the electrode case, we again uh, derive the dispersion relation. We see that uh, we have a similar uh, uh, wave propagation condition. We need to, uh, as for the numerical result, we need to analyze uh, the case where k bar is zero. Because if we consider k equals to zero, then obviously this k bar, this k is zero. So we see that k bar uh, is, uh, is uh, sitting with this uh, mu s. And uh, it is basically uh, act, uh, as a uh, surface shear modulus. So uh, again, we consider two different type of piezoelectric uh, material, ZT5H and, for example, uh, barium tantalate. So uh, and for the surface elasticity, we are considering gold membrane, uh, not the aluminium because that is not satisfying the condition. So uh, uh, based on that, so we consider uh, we are uh, drawing a omega uh, k dispersion. Here we see that uh, the cut-on frequency is the blue one, and the cut-off frequency is the minimum of this red and the green one. So we see that uh, the dispersion is the, uh, we are having a two dispersion curve, but only one is uh, in the uh, dispersion region. We are also drawing uh, this uh, magenta curve, that is, uh, this, this is related to C star, which is the, uh, which is the K bar. Two, two minutes left. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, and uh, we, we next we uh, take the K bar zero, and we see that uh, the previous 
curve which is uh, going outside the region, it's coming into the region after a certain wave number. And uh, if we draw uh, phase velocity curves, uh, we see uh, for the non uh, uh, for non-zero uh, k bar, and we see that uh, we, we compare uh, unelectroded and unelectroded case, and we uh, we see that uh, the unelectroded case is much, uh, having the higher phase velocity than the and again, if we take the KVAR zero, then we see that we have another curve just like in the omega K distribution. We can also uh, uh, study the uh, 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 mechanical imperfect bonding, uh, uh, and the mechanical imperfect bonding having effect, uh, which is really decreasing uh, to the uh, phase velocity, uh, and uh, for the both uh, uh, electrode and non-electrode cases. And similarly, uh, we can also study the gamma phi, which is the electrical imperfect bonding. And uh, we see that uh, uh, it is also having a similar decreasing effect as we obtained uh, in the gamma. And uh, we see that uh, the effect is very small as compared to uh, gamma. So as the conclusions, we have a closed form, uh, we have uh, derived the closed form dispersion relations for model one and model two. And uh, it, it has a very uh, uh, vast application in the engineering fields and as well as biomechanics like for the uh, discussed about the bone implantation, how uh, new uh, surfaces are uh, generated uh, uh, bones. Uh, we are uh, we are also finding a dispersion curves uh, as related to log wave in a layer half phase configuration. And we uh, if we try to uh, decrease this layer width, and we see that uh, it is approaching to uh, the geo model. In case of uh, piezoelectric substrate having uh, imperfect bonding and surface elasticity, we take this uh, KVAR zero and all the higher vibrational uh, modes uh, disappear. And the uh, mechanical imperfect bonding has a decreasing effect on the frequency curve uh, in uh, both cases. And same can be observed in uh, electrical imperfect bonding in unelectrical case, but the effect is very small. And we have also uh, seen that uh, uh, for the same uh, piezoelectric material, as well as for the electrolytic case, which is due to the boundary condition, Electrical imperfect bonding does not appear. So we have uh, some future uh, planning for this uh, research. We can also incorporate mass loading, which is very uh, common for this uh, type of uh, uh, log wave sensors. Uh, also, we can study the electromechanical coupling parameter. And uh, we can take this uh, piezoelectric material and extend it to piezo-magnetoelastic material. Uh, we can uh, implement uh, anisotropy, piezoelectricity, or the non-locality in this uh, GM model. And for the numerical uh, analysis, we can also uh, find a higher element method and, and perfectly matched layer method, and also uh, as boundary element. So these are some of the references. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. You used a little bit more time than you were expected, but we have time for maybe one fast question. Online audience. Uh, may I ask one question? Yeah. Uh, Fast one, please. Okay. Okay. I just have yeah. a quick uh, query. I mean, uh, you consider some model now, which is a half space in both the sides or some finite layer at there. Can you go to the 16, slide number 16? Yeah. Yeah. So, is there any finite layer at there in uh, this model? So, uh, we are considering the surface elasticity with very infinitesimally thin uh, membrane. And uh, that is attached with uh, at the interface, and we are considering two substrate. Okay, so uh, both the sides are half space. No yeah. finite things are there, right? No, no. no. Okay, and uh, is it the uh, x is upper side is positive or negatively down down uh, upwards? It's a positive x, upwards, x, right? X one or x two? Which one? X one. X one is uh, positively upward. Positively upward. And what so that's why I have taken that uh, exponential term as positive and negative. I have changed that. Uh, and what boundary condition you applied over here? At the so that's, uh, we have to uh, implement the surface elasticity as well as the non perfect bonding uh, parameter. Okay, yeah, thank you uh, once again, Riganka, for I your think Professor, anyone wants to pass it? Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. We are moving to next uh, presentation. We have one question uh, from Victor Yermev. Yeah. Very, very fast question. Yeah, please. Uh, may I? Yes, please. But yeah. uh, I have exactly this question uh, to 
Electric boundary conditions, because you consider it electroded once, but um, is other kind of uh, electric boundary conditions could be possible or not? Yes, of course, sir. And also there are uh, different types of uh, like open circuit and short circuit conditions. Right? Okay, exactly what I mean, because it could influence on, let's say, electrical device and performance of the devices. So the uh, last paper that has been done on this uh, piezoelectric uh, material, they have considered this type of boundary conditions, so I have uh, implemented them just to Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the nice presentation, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, so the uh, next uh, speaker is Enrico Radi from uh, University of uh, Modena and Reggio Emilia in uh, Italy. And the title of the presentation is Non Standard Contact Condition Between a Beam and a Couple Stress Elastic Half Plane. Enrica, are you here? I think I uh, saw him among the participants. Yeah, here, here is he. Enrica, do you hear us? Should be some uh, problems with the connection or? Enrica, could you please switch on your microphone? Enrica, we do At the bottom left. And we cannot hear you. Yeah, I guess uh, there is some kind of some kind of problem with the connection for Enrico, maybe for his equipment. Okay, we. Uh, I propose that we wait for two minutes. Yeah, and then if. Uh, Problem is still 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 there. Then we proceed with a coffee break, and then uh, maybe Enrico can make his uh, presentation if if we have any free slot at the uh, after coffee break uh, session. So we wait for two minutes. Uh, okay, so it's uh, still uh, still a problem with the connection or equipment for Enrique. So we now have a coffee break for. Uh, so we are starting next uh, session at 5:20.
Moscow time, so in uh, half an hour. So we make a break for half an hour and then uh, see you again 20 past, uh, 20 past uh, 5. No, this is uh, in 40 minutes, so we have 40 minutes break. So 20 past uh, 5, Moscow time, see you back for continuation of the session. Let's okay. then follow the timetable and start with the, the next uh, presentation by uh, Maria Vilde. I see that she's online, so please, welcome. Uh, hello. So please, uh, you have your 20 minutes, share your screen. Can, I, can everybody see my presentation? Yes, we can. You can. It's it's fine. It's fine. This is some simple problem comparing with all that I heard today. It's some problem about waste in usual as a traffic elastic plate. The outline is very simple. Also, some introduction with the motivation of this problem, then the statement of the problem, the method of solution, and results. All straight, straight format. We will deal with fundamental symmetric H wave. This is a wave which can be excited by some load placed on the edge or near the edge is propagates along the edge and decays exponentially from the edge. More particulars about this wave, you can read in this excellent review. It's many investigation about this wave. It's well known this in the low low wave limit, we can, we can describe it by plate extension theory, but it's in them in plate extension theory, it has no dispersion, but in reality, it is dispersive. If we solve the same problem in exact, exact three dimensional period of elasticity, we will see that this wave has dispersion, so its speed depends on the frequency. I solved it myself and found, found the curve of dispersion of this wave. But until the last three or four years, I never dreamed that I can see sometimes this waves in nature. But on one conference in Rostov, in Rostov, I will acquaint with Dr. Golub and Dr. Hyerman. Actually, with his pupils from the first. But then Dr. Golub write me on email and proposed collaboration. They were interested in experiments and they found that there were practically no, no experiments about each waves, but and they do experiments with such a plate. It's plate from aluminium, five millimeter thickness. It, it this is all published result in this paper. We can see. We can you can read if you're interested. I saw this main picture. This is experimental data. The comparison with theoretical dispersion curves, we can see that this fundamental symmetrical H wave very good coincide this dispersion curve very good coincide with experimental this is so called frequency wave number wave number analysis so simply two dimensional Fourier transform we will see maximum as dispersion curve from the experiment. We will see this wave is very good excited. But then uh, the techniques of 
experimental data experimental data treatment was improved. We study new method, matrix pencil method, which allows to obtain dispersion curves in, in the case of in this, this dependencies, dependencies. And so we can see that this wave also very good coincides with his dispersion curves, but also this method allows to obtain imaginary path, imaginary path, part of the wave number. And so we can see that this wave has attenuation. When the theory don't predict this, this wave lays, uh, this frequency lays lower than first cutoff, cutoff frequency. So it can attenuate because of radiation from the edge, but maybe this attenuation from some dissipation until the eternal friction, but it seems to be large for aluminum. And this, this is some problem that arises because of this possibility to, to obtain this pressure curve. So it's, we can calculate phase velocity. And we can see that phase velocity behaves very different from that behavior which predicted by the three-dimensional theory. The dispersion, this so this velocity decreased, but from the experiment we clearly see this increasing. It's but why it's we cannot understand. And I examined minutely the pictures of this play, and I have some hypothesis. One hypothesis: that this uh, the reason is imperfection of the age profile. We can see that this plate, this edge, is not perfectly straight, rectangular. We can see small fa facets, but at here, I can help seeing some inclination or tilt or bevel, how it's called re correctly. I don't know, but beveled edge, maybe. So edge is beveled, but in addition, has small facets. So it's problem states to calculate, calculate H wave in such a plate and to prove this hypothesis. Will we obtain the behavior that we have from experiment or not? This is the motivation of my problem. The statement, statement of the problem is not quite complicated, but what complicated is the form. The equation is standard equation of elastic dynamics. So we can, is usually presented in wave equations. What are boundary conditions on the faces? Three faces on the, but H is now consists of three parts. All this together we will denote as contour L. L. So on L we can we can state some forwarding. So two problems, or straight edge only with facets, or beveled edge also with facets. This method I used already many times, but never, never failed me. Semi-analytical method based on expansion on modus, modus of an elastic layer, this is partial solution, which satisfied boundary conditions on the faces. Here we can, we could use only symmetrical parts of modus if we do not have beveled, beveled edge, but beveled edge leads to asymmetric, asymmetric solution. So we can use, we must use both symmetric and anti-symmetric modus to satisfy this boundary condition for this, this second problem, with asymmetrical age. So in the mind parts of the, uh, without this boundary, the symmetrical and anti-symmetrical motions are separated, but they are connected by this boundary conditions. This problem I never never solved yet, it was interesting how, how it will look, the solution is such a problem. 
Then we solve dispersion equation with the roads, each row defines a model, and we look the solution in the form of a linear combination mode, the sum on our coefficients CM. There are some computational problems. I usually use the collocation method, but for this kind, kind of ages, it does not work. So what energetical, energetical approach is is all right. So it allows to obtain some solution, but if facets and this inclination not very large, because there is boundary, boundary ways, rapidly decaying models, we, we have bet on the these parts. This method was was tested has been tested by comparison with COMSOL, with some results. Looked look very good. And we tested it on some simplified problem. It's plain problem about vibration. We found some first natural uh, eigen vibrations. And we can see that same analytical method at COMSOL gives five digits, five digits, all equal, and further console doesn't give the result, so we can define the first frequency, second frequency, all, all coincide. And this is for the right rectangular plate and plate with facets to show this method can correctly describe the influence influence of these facets is what, for example, such frequency without facets, that facets this is increase. And, and console and semi-analytical method gives the same results. And this fourth frequency and the form, forms also if we can compare it, that we make all coincide. And so we can use this method for our problem. This is, I don't know, do you see all the screen? All? This is, yes, we see. It's all right. At, uh, I, now I see it still. <laughs> With the zoom, not quite familiar. So this is for four types, uh, four variants of the ages. R is standard or canonical rectangular age. This is usually considered in the, all the theories of the age of. So cross-section perpendicular to the faces. Here this very small, very small faces, some, so, a little bit, a little bit larger and also small, all, all the small, as you can see, this is a real, a real scale. I try to, for, for example, I, to show real scale in these pictures, it's, it's all, it's all was estimated from the pictures that I show in the introduction, it's hard to estimate exactly these, these parameters from the photos, but uh, plate itself is in Germany, and my colleagues only in the next year can be there again and measure this, this face, facets. But now we can only deduce it from the wave, from the information about wave propagation. So I try three cases, one, two, and three, and we see on this on this picture the phase velocity. Red is without faces. One, one, we can see that despite they are very small, still the phase velocity grows, then more grows, and I was surprised that Third case, 
very good, very good coincide with this experimental data, which was surprising for us. So it can be, can be said that it seems to be that the reason is indeed that this facet is the reason this difference in behavior of the face velocity. This is all parameters, thickness of the plate, five millimeters, so it is very small compared to this thickness, and this is this is long wave range. The wave length is more more than thickness, and so this is dimensions very small compared to the wave length. Nevertheless, we see some strong influence influence. But uh, it's of course scale would not very not very large from the quantity point of view, but this still still difference quality difference this asymptotics goes one sign it change change the sign we see this asymptotic in square of frequency but it's coefficients change sign even even from because of this small small facets and this is beverly at h this theta one theta one is the angle of this inclination this is taken so guess a pure guess what five i tried five degrees five degrees was not quite good now we can see that change this beveled building this or uh, inclination of the edge not very much change the behavioral velocity but goes increase more and high at, at high frequencies but still it's fast the same as because of this so this behavior is because of the facets but because of the inclination of the edge we have attenuation and this is attenuation it's not so easy to, to obtain from the experiment maybe this is this big not so rigorously maybe it's on, but what we obtain definitely some of this behavior of attenuation that is imaginary part of the wave number attenuation of the wave so we can see that the best the best results gives by again a zero point twenty five millimeter and theta one four degrees five degrees were very too much but for for it seems to be bad so it also we can say that this attenuation, which we cannot understand from the theory of the H wave, is caused by this small inclination, which is lead to coupling between symmetric and anti-symmetric motions. But in this frequency range, there is propagating, propagating anti-symmetric wave, which radiates part of the energy from the edge. This effect can be observed also in shells and two layer plates with non-symmetrical layers and also in this case. Maybe it can be useful to some uh, testing of the small geometrical and perfectness of the edge, some defects connected with it, and perfectness of so on. Mm -hmm. With this short conclusions. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Questions, please? I'm not sure if I'm doing everything correctly, so... Okay, we will have hand here in Zoom, I think, yes? So we can check. Okay, okay. So then, uh, since we have no questions in Zoom, maybe offline. I have a little question. Uh, so you mentioned that you, you compared your calculations to the 3D theory, right? Yes, yes. And your calculations were also 3D, but with uh, accounting for faces, or no? Yes, yes. Of course, 3D. We can uh, take into account facets in two-dimensional period. It's average along the thickness. So it's of course it's three-dimensional theory, all three-dimensional. And uh, is it possible uh, further to account for the shape of the face? For example, if it is not, if it is round or. Ellipsoid or whatever. It's possible or oh, any any shape, but not very not very different from the straight edge. Some small small inclination with big big um, some computational problems. Uh, theoretically, any shape any shape can take into account that this method. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, if we have. Uh, no more questions, we may proceed to the next presenter. It will be... May I, may I try to present? Oh, hello. Yes. Hello, sorry for, for the delay. Oh, nice. We found you, yes. So, before the next presenter, we, we are going back in our schedule. Uh, for Dr. Raddy. He's going to uh, present us... Um, is work about non-local contact conditions. So please. Okay, thank you for your presentation and sorry everybody for my delay, but uh, there should be some problem with my laptop. I hope that uh, will, I, I will be able to finish my presentation. And uh, now I'm sharing. Okay, can you see the presentation and you mean everything is okay? Yeah, it works fine, thank you. Okay, in this work I studied the problem of a contact between a deformable beam, a Euler Bernoulli beam, and a couple stress elastic half plane by imposing a different contact condition on the couple stress traction and the micro rotation along the contact zone. In particular, I, in particular, I consider an Eulero-Bernoulli Bernoulli beam in bilateral, quindi fully frictional contact with a couple stress elastic half plane uh, described by the constrained couple stress theory developed by Coiter. Um, under the beam is under an arbitrary loading, and the problem is uh, in the framework of 2D uh, couple stress elasticity. So it's a plane problem. In particular, the half plane, the couple stress half plane, is characterized by the constitutive parameter, the shear modulus, Poisson coefficient, and the material characteristic length, L whereas the beam is characterized by the bending stiffness EI. <laughs> we assume, I assume in this, uh, in this uh, problem that uh, both contact pressure and couple stress traction are transmitted, uh, are exchanged between the beam and the half plane surface. This problem finds practical application for instance, in the railway tracks, uh, ray, uh, laying on railway ballast on the building foundation beam, uh, resting on soil or granular material, on beams uh, on masonry, for instance, so masonry can be considered as a microstructured material, uh, in uh, biomechanics uh, for implants on bone, over bones, 
And as well in micromechanics, for instance, in the design of MEMS and NEMS, so at micro and nano scale. As well known, the elasticity, the classical elasticity, has no length scale, and therefore it cannot simulate uh, the size effect at small scale, is not able to model material with microstructure and materials at micron and nano scale. In these cases, uh, um, um, the, is, it, there is a need for more refined and more advanced and constitutive theory, like, for instance, the couple stress theory or the micropolar theory of elasticity. This theory provides an alternative approach with respect to atomistic simulation or lattice model, and which are able to, in, to, um, to embed a, a characteristic constitutive length on the material and thus to uh, figure out the uh, size effect. Of course, uh, this, uh, this enhanced constitutive theory requires additional boundary condition. In this case, the boundary condition are on micro rotation and couple stress traction. Therefore, it, uh, it appears the problems on, of how to extend the contact condition to include the effect of micro rotation and couple stress traction. Of course, the contact condition depends on the structure, on the microstructure characteristic of the surface. In this work, we consider three different boundary, three different contact conditions. Uh, the fifth condition is the vanishing of couple strike traction, which is usually assumed in most of the, of the literature works, of the literature of the works present in the literature. The second assumption, the second uh, condition, that, uh, that second alternative condition is the vanishing of micro rotation. This condition has been assumed by few uh, authors in the, in the literature. And the third condition that I suggest is the compatibility between the micro rotation of the surface of the half plane and the macro, macro rotation of the beam cross section of the beam and therefore the slope of the beam since we are dealing with a Euler Bernoulli beam. Uh, okay, here is the plane of the work. We first derive, we actually, we first use the Green's function for point forces. This function has been derived by Panos uh, um, Ger and by Gergadis group and his co worker. And then we, I obtain, as following this approach, also the Green's function for a couple, applied for a unit couple applied at the surface of the couple stress half, half plane. Using this green function, we can uh, formulate the different microstructural boundary condition as in the form of singular integral equation for the pressure and couple stress traction. Uh, after, a preliminary, after a preliminary asymptotic analysis, we found that the, um, the pressure and couples, both couple stress traction and pressure displays quite root singularity at the end of the, of the contact zone. And therefore, we use uh, a representation of um, this function in terms of series of Chebyshev polynomial displaying square root, square root singularity. Then, by using the collocation method, we reduce the integral equation to a linear algebraic system. And finally, we obtain a result uh, for the contact pressure, the couple stress traction, and as well as for the shear force and bending moment along the beam, varying the stiffness of the beam, the relative stiffness of the beam with respect to the ground, and varying the characteristic length of the ground with, with respect to the, to the beam length. Um, these uh, three different, the three different uh, boundary condition, contact condition that we, uh, that I assume, uh, led to different uh, result in terms of uh, shear of bending moment and shear force, and they are able to show to display the size effect due to the um, 
presence of a characteristic land in the ground. The work extends previous investigation on beam in contact with elastic plane performed by Shield and Kim and later by Lanzoni and Radi. And more recently, uh, there are contributions uh, concerning the rigid indenter, a rigid indenter uh, in contact with a couple stress elastic half plane performed by Georgiadis group, uh, in particular by Panos Gorgiotis and Thesis. However, all this investigation uh, neglects the couple stress traction along the contact zone. This because they want to recover the classic elastic solution as the characteristic length of the soil of the ground it becomes vanishing small. Okay, the constitutive model has been present of couple stress of the coiter, couple stress theory of elasticity with constrained rotation has been presented at the, at the in the previous section by my colleague Andrea Nobili. Here we use a particular formulation in terms of two stress function proposed for the first time by, Mid by Midlin. We express therefore the stress, the stress component and the couple stress component in terms of these two stress function, two scalar function. Then we were able, by using the constitutive relation, we express uh, the strain, the component, and the compatibility between strains yield to two partial differential equation for the uh, two stress function. These two partial differential equations are both of fourth order and they are decoupled. Integration then of strains and curvature allows to obtain displacement and rotation fields. Oh, here is the green function for a unit force derived by Gurgotis and Thesis by using the middling stress function and the Fourier transform. In the plot uh, taken from the paper of um, these authors, uh, we have the trend of uh, the displacement, the vertical displacement, which is singular under the concentrated force. And this is the rotation, the micro rotation, which is uh, finite, in particular is zero, is vanishing uh, under, under the concentrated forces. It must, be, it must be noted that for elasticity, for classical elasticity, the rotation is unbounded under the force. Uh, is the, the, for elasticity, the classical elasticity behavior is this behavior with dashed line, which goes to infinite as uh, x goes to zero. The analytical expression of the, of the Green's function are proposed, are reported here. We have in particular the, the, not the displacement, but the slope. This is the slope produced by a unit uh, vertical force. And this is the micro rotation produced by the same forces, the analytical expression. Then we derive the green function, the corresponding green function for the couple, for a couple, for a unit couple. And uh, um, in the, this plot uh, are reported the displacement. This is the vertical displacement ca caused by this unit couple. And this is the rotation, which is singular. Uh, correspondingly, we have the analytical expression of the slope and of the rotation produced by a unit couple. Moreover, we use, we consider for the Euler-Bernoulli beam, the fourth order differential, ordinary differential equation, where V is the transversal displacement of the beam, and the Q is the apply and the load to the beam, whereas P and M are the contact pressure and couple stress traction. And uh, uh, the, total, the, total, the total force, the total load acting on the beam is therefore the, the sum of the um, load applied to the beam, contact pressure, plus the derivative of the couple stress traction. Integrating this three times this equation using the boundary condition, we obtain the analytical expression for the slope, as well as the balance condition for the full beam the balance condition, force, and moment. 
Okay, let's uh, have a look at the condition, at the boundary condition uh, along the contact uh, zone. We impose the classical boundary condition of vanishing stress, shear stress, uh, which is already satisfied by the green function. And then we impose the same displacement, actually the same slope, both for this, the beam and the half plane surface. Uh, in this case, we, by, by dealing with the slope, we avoid to introduce a rigid body motion. With the slope of the half plane surface uh, has been derived as the convolution between the, dist the distribution of uh, pressure and couple, uh, couple stress traction uh, with the, um, the green function for unit uh, force and the unit couple. Then, the distribution of, couple of uh, pressure and couple stress traction are assumed in the form of a series of, uh, uh, of uh, Chebyshev polynomial of fifth order, which are singular, this, this series has the square root. So we reduce the, the, the unknown to the coefficient Pn and Mn of this series. Uh, the balance condition already provided the fifth term, the fifth coefficient, P0 and M0 of this series. Uh, after some manipulation and some in integral in the closed form, we can uh, transform the, the, the condition, the boundary condition on the slope in this form, in this form, where the unknown are the coefficient Pn and Mn appearing here. Moreover, we introduce this uh, ratio for between the characteristic length of the soil and the, characteristic and the length of the beam. And this beta uh, is proportional to the compliance of the beam with respect to the soil. And these other parameters are a dimensional parameter. Moreover, this integral, these two functions, an and bn, has been calculated in closed form, can be calculated in closed form. Okay, this equation is the classical uh, boundary contact condition, uh, which uh, der derived from equating the, the slope of both, uh, uh, both, uh, of both faces. We should add uh, three, another boundary condition concerning about uh, which is different uh, and is defined according to the microstructure of the material. As a fist, uh, as a condition of type one, we uh, consider the vanishing of capo stress traction. In this case, the coefficient m n are all vanishing. And the coefficient Pn can be obtained by the previous equation by using a collocation method. We then extend the analysis by considering a different boundary condition, namely the vanishing of micro-rotation at the surface of the couple stress elasticity plane. If we impose the vanishing of rotation, uh, we can write the rotation as well using the, using the Green's function. We obtain then this new equation for the coefficient Pn and Mn, which can be uh, solved together with the previous equation on the slope by using a collocation procedure. So by using, uh, by evaluating these two equations at a fixed number of points, we obtain the coefficient Pn and Mn. Finally, the third condition, the third type of condition, of contact condition, concerns the equality between the micro-rotation and the macro-rotation of the beam. This uh, has never been imposed, at least in the literature, and uh, has, be, has been considered here for the first time, and it seems, uh, to my opinion, one of the most reasonable uh, assumptions. In this case, we obtain uh, in this, this equation in closed form, uh, which can be solved together with the classical boundary condition, already by using a collocation procedure. In particular, we consider a number of terms greater than 30, 
and we consider, we assume as collocation point, the roots of Chebyshev polynomial. Once we uh, obtain the coefficient Pn and Mn, then the bending moment and the shear force in the beam can be calculated analytically by using this relation, where this uh, function uh, has been calculated in closed form as well. These are the results for the contact condition of type 1, so for vanishing couple stress traction. In this case, uh, for a beam under a, a uniformly distributed load Q, we uh, observe the variation, this curve are, are relative to different value of the characteristic length ratio, lambda. For lambda equal 0 0.01, actually the effect of the characteristic length, the, the, the characteristic length is almost vanishing small. So we obtain the classical elastic solution, these red lines actually. For, for lambda equals zero, we obtain the, the classical elastic solution. Then we obtain, as lambda increase, we observe a non-monotonic trend. At least, the, uh, the, for instance, the bending moment and the shear force, as the parameter lambda increase, at least there is an increase of the bending moment and the shear force in the beam, and then a decrease. So the maximum value of the moment and the shear and the shear force are obtained for value for intermediate value of lambda about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. This is the, these are the results for boundary condition of type 2, so vanishing micro-rotation on the surface, of, on the contact surface. What happens as the, as the uh, parameter lambda, the characteristic length, is increased? Uh, we observe, uh, first of all, that as lambda goes to zero, the, mic, the couple stress traction are almost vanishing everywhere except at the beam ends, where they display this square root singularity. Then, as, and therefore, the elastic solution uh, is more or less uh, obtained in the limit as lambda goes to zero. But as lambda increases, as, as the characteristic length increases, uh, we observe that. Uh, uh, P, the pressure, increase at the center of the contact zone, and uh, particularly the, the couple stress traction increase remarkably. This increase in the couple stress traction provide a, a, a remarkable increase of the bending moment along the beam, and a variation of the shear force, which decreased and became also negative and changed its sign on the beam along the beam. These effects are due to the moment traction which are required for constraining, for, for annually annihilating the micro-rotation on the half plane surface. Finally, these are the results for boundary condition of type 3, so equating the micro-rotation to the macro-rotation. We observe that uh, the the pre contact pressure is almost uh, uh, not influenced by the characteristic length, and so also the shear force are almost the same for every value of the characteristic length. But uh, the micro, the couple stress traction are strongly influenced by the cap by the by the characteristic length. And so also the bending moment. The bending moment has already this non-monotonic variation, which uh, attain their maximum value for intermediate value of lambda about 0.2.3. Okay. So then we have uh, uh, then we analyze the effect of the beam compliance. Uh, but in this case, they are more similar to the elastic, uh, the, the, to the classical elastic uh, solution. Actually, as the beam compliance increase, the pressure increase at the center of the contact zone, and the moment uh, and the shear force decrease in agreement with the classical elastic solution. 
Okay. Where eta, as you can see, is the parameter proportional to the compliance, to the elastic compliance of the beam. Enrico, sorry for the interruption, but... Okay, okay, okay. I'm in one minute, I will finish. These are the result, the, the effect of low eccentricity, which are as well similar to the case of a classical elasticity. So I skip this result and I came to the conclusion. Say, we, we saw that we observed that the magnitude of couple strike traction increased with the characteristic length. Uh, the contribution of uh, the couple strike traction is usually smaller with respect to the pressure, but, and uh, mainly restricted to the, end, the, to the beam ends. However, they have a great influence on the bending moment and the shear force. The result uh, shows size-dependent behavior, and in particular when the uh, characteristic length has the same uh, value of the, of the beam length. However, um, that, that it, it, it is, it's important to observe that uh, taking into consideration the micropolar behavior of the ground, couple stress uh, elasticity behavior of the ground, but neglecting the contact couple stress may lead to an underestimation of the bending moment along the beam. This result may serve as a reference for designing of a structural component both at macro scale and micro scale, providing a fundamental basis for the assessment of proper macrostructural contact condition. The, for future extension, a uh, possible extension regard uh, unilateral contact so, um, and the bonding, studying the effect of friction, uh, extending to the three-dimensional problem, and then study the buckling response and the dynamical response of this uh, um, structural um, model. Okay, thank you for your attention and sorry for the delay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a very, very short question, if any. I just had a very quick question to Enrique, if possible. Sure. I just, uh, you know, very interesting. Uh, indeed, what would happen in case of dynamic load? So if you could uh, maybe just speculate just a little bit, what will be? Yeah, yes, it, I, the, in dynamic load, it would be very interesting. I spoke with Andrea, which is an expert in dynamics. But uh, first of all, we have to derive the, the, the Green's function for dynamics, which has not been derived. So I think it's one of the most challenging problems between those I proposed at the end. First of all, we have to derive the, 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 the Green's function in this case, at least if the, if the beam is of finite length. We can study, for instance, a uh, beam of infinite length, which is more simple. This is more, we can start from this point, from this problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and let's then move to the next uh, presentation, which is going to be made by um, Onur Sahin, right? Yeah, hello. Ah, uh, hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, let me first. So you have uh, 20 minutes. I can start uh, share my screen. Yeah, Enrique, you should finish your. Yes. You can start sharing screen. Hello again. Uh, I'm Onur Shine. Uh, I work at the uh, Department of Mathematics of Giresun University in Turkey. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, dynamic problems uh, for a perturbed plastic rectangle uh, subject to end loadings. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say something about why we consider this problem. Uh, as known, uh, dynamics of elastic structure uh, is an important topic uh, due to its numerous applications in modern industries. Uh, at the same time, uh, even over a low frequency range, uh, well below uh, resonance domain, 
uh, corrections to rigid body dynamics uh, seems to be of interest. Uh, the classical setup uh, excludes the possibility of incorporating the effects of self-accurate loading, uh, internal dissipation, in homogeneous and deformability. Also, uh, the self-accurate loading, uh, the effect of which is uh, generally omitted by uh, classical rigid body dynamics, uh, may be important for various applications, uh, such as uh, longitudinal railway dynamics. And uh, developing a perturbation technique for such problems uh, enables to express displacements and stresses uh, in simple explicit forms and uh, to better understanding of the problems. Uh, let's now state our problem. Uh, we consider an elastic rectangle uh, given in figure one and uh, subject to end loadings uh, applied along the edge of the uh, rectangle. Uh, here we analyze uh, the dynamics of the problem for uh, anti-plane and in-plane motions uh, of the rectangle respectively. So first uh, we consider anti-plane problem. Uh, the okay, equations uh, of motion for anti-plane motion of the rectangle may be given by the, this equation. Uh, here uh, sigma i3 uh, are stress tensor components, uh, u3 is uh, out of plane displacement, uh, is time and row is density. Uh, the boundary condition uh, resulting from the uh, end loadings uh, are given by the following equations. And uh, here P and Q are prescribed loads. Uh, let's now uh, specify a small parameter, uh, lambda uh, related to low frequency regime. Uh, here T is a typical time scale. Uh, C2 uh, is transverse phase speed uh, with angular frequency omega. And uh, we should also note that uh, lambda uh, is order of uh, omega times L1 over C2. Uh, we now obtain a, an approximate uh, formulation for uh, the displacements of the considered problem uh, with the help of a uh, small parameter. Uh, to this end, we introduce uh, dimensional variables uh, and uh, dimensionless, uh, sorry, dimensionless variables and dimensionless quantities. And uh, writing the above uh, governing equation uh, and boundary conditions uh, in terms of these dimensionless variables and quantities, uh, we get the following equations. And uh, let's now expand uh, the displacement and stress components uh, into the asymptotic series and substituting them uh, into the above scaled uh, equations and boundary conditions, uh, we arrive at uh, leading order uh, to the following boundary value problem. So uh, it, it can be seen from the last equation that uh, U3 node, which is the uh, leading order displacement, is only a function of tau. And uh, substituting this expression into the leading order uh, governing equation and integrating it uh, over the rectangular region and also considering the boundary condition, uh, we get an integral equalities uh, for the uh, leading order out of plane displacement. Uh, which uh, also corresponds as expected to uh, Nifton's second law. And at the next order, uh, we have the following boundary value problem. And uh, here the problem uh, may be cast into uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we only consider the symmetric case. And uh, therefore, uh, we assume that the uh, P plus and minus are even in by two, and uh, Q plus and minus equal to zero. Uh, in this case, uh, the solution uh, of homogeneous part of the leading order equation uh, is written uh, in this form. And here, A, N, and B, N, uh, the coefficients A and B, N, uh, may be expressed by these integral equalities. And uh, the particular solution of the uh, above the uh, next order equation uh, may be written uh, like uh, quadratic forms. 
and uh, substituting uh, this solution into the above equation and also uh, considering a higher order approximation for stresses, the coefficients of uh, the particular solution may be obtained like that. Uh, therefore, we uh, obtain all the uh, terms of the uh, approximate formulation and we uh, now uh, study a specific uh, type loading to analyze our problem. So we consider time harmonic uh, uniform loading in the following form uh, with the constant uh, amplitude uh, below uh, the time harmonic factor uh, will be omitted. So employing the uh, obtained formulation, we have the following uh, expression expressions uh, for the leading order displacements, displacement uh, and the coefficients of the next order uh, solution respectively. As the scaled displacements uh, may be written like that, uh, here uh, it's verified that the, the last two term uh, asymptotic behavior of the, this uh, approximate formulation is uh, identical to its counterpart uh, following from the uh, exact solution which is present in the appendix. And the acceleration at the center, uh, in this case, uh, takes this form, uh, which leads to a correction to classical rigid body dynamics uh, expressed by these uh, uh, equations. And uh, it should be also uh, note that uh, at the center of the rectangle, uh, formula for the uh, scale uh, out of displacements uh, also is also valid uh, for uh, taking into account uh, the effect of self accelerated uh, load low frequency loading and also uh, obviously uh, the classical setup uh, the classical rigid body model uh, is not applicable in the later case uh, and we now uh, present some numerical results for uh, the, uh, for non self equated type uh, loading. Uh, here, uh, figure two uh, displays uh, comparisons of uh, asymptotic formula uh, and exact solution of the uh, non dimensional uh, out of plane uh, displacements uh, uh, plotted against uh, frequency lambda. And uh, can be seen that uh, the asymptotic formula uh, is uh, efficient for the non uh, small value of the lambda. And uh, figure three uh, displays uh, relative errors for leading uh, and next order approximations uh, at the center of the uh, rectangle. And uh, it's seen that uh, for the small values of uh, frequency, a small parameter lambda, uh, we have uh, small relative errors. And now uh, we investigate in plane motion of the same elastic rectangle uh, as in the previous uh, section, subject to the same uh, longitudinal load. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the equation of motion and boundary condition uh, are uh, given by the following equation. And here uh, we again uh, assume that Sorry. We again assume that uh, P uh, plus and minus are even uh, in X2. As above, we adopt the same uh, small parameter and uh, using uh, use the same uh, using the following scaling, uh, the governing equation and boundary condition uh, can be written like these equations. And expanding the displacement and stress components uh, into the asymptotic series uh, and substituting them uh, into the above scaled equations and boundary conditions, uh, we arrive at uh, leading order to boundary value problem, following boundary value problem. And uh, it can be obtained the following relations uh, from the first uh, and third equation of the above equations, uh, which uh, results that uh, u1 naught is a function of y2 and tau and 
also u to not uh, is function of y van and tau. Uh, therefore, uh, it's concluded from the second equation of the above equations that um, the leading order displacements uh, uh, only uh, depend uh, on the tau, uh, which uh, corresponding to rigid body translation of the rectangle. Then uh, substituting this leading order expression into the uh, leading order equation. And uh, we have the following two equations and uh, integrating it again over the rectangular region and uh, considering the boundary conditions, uh, we uh, have uh, integral equality for uh, leading order uh, longitudinal displacements, uh, which uh, corresponds to Newton's second law similar to the previous section. At the next order, uh, we have a boundary value problem uh, given as below. Uh, here, uh, the elliptic problem uh, for the rectangle may be reduced to a biharmonic equation, uh, which received a lot of attention uh, in numerous publications. At the same time, uh, its solution uh, cannot be expressed uh, in a simple forms. Therefore, uh, here we... Uh, consider a specific uh, problem. So uh, we restrict uh, our analysis to an elongated rectangle uh, for small parameter eta. And uh, we specify uh, the scale displacements uh, V1 and V2 and substituting them uh, into the above uh, governing equation, leading uh, next order governing equation, we uh, get a boundary value problem uh, like that. And uh, now we are looking for the solution of the above boundary value problem in the following asymptotic form and substituting this form uh, into the above problem at leading order, uh, the problem is formulated as below. I'm, I'm really sorry for the interruption, but I think we should move to conclusions because you, you, I guess you're out of 20 minutes. Okay. So I should move the conclusions. Yeah, it's up to you. I mean, uh, <laughs> you are, we have a time schedule, so it's up to you to decide what you fit into the. Yeah. Room. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So after uh, all calculation, uh, we get a full uh, approximate uh, solution for the considered uh, displacements of the problem, and uh, then we uh, consider a specific. Uh, problem uh, one dimensional theory of plant from the one dimensional theory of plant extension and uh, if we apply the formulation uh, obtained above uh, we get a approximate formation for the uh, scale displacements of this problem and then we give some uh, numerical results for uh, this formulation and our conclusion, uh, the first order low frequency corrections to uh, rigid body translation of the elastic rectangle uh, are derived for a class of uh, prescribed stress uh, applied to its uh, two opposite sides. Uh, obtained formation allow of calculating the variation of uh, stresses and displacements uh, over its interior including the case of uh, self-accurate loading, uh, which uh, cannot be treated by uh, classical uh, rigid body dynamics. And for the plane problem, we have a correction, uh, which uh, have a term uh, which coefficient uh, can be expressed through the rapidly convergent series. The explicit results for the in-plane problem uh, are present for a language rectangle, uh, which may be also analyzed using the elementary theory of plant extension. Although, although the static uh, plane problem uh, has no close front uh, in the general setup, it can be reduced to uh, the well-known biharmonic uh, problem. And the developed perturbation techniques may be extended to an arbitrary set of stresses applied to size of rectangle. And the finally, uh, developed methodology seems to have a potential to be implemented for uh, three-dimensional solids and more general geometries. And, um, our appendix uh, here we gives the exact solution of the plane problem and one dimensional plane problem and our references. Uh, 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So please, uh, one one question. I think we have time for one question. Anybody? So uh, then I have a short question. Uh, well, is it possible uh, to use your results to enhance some numerical methods? Let's say maybe to introduce uh, some of um, your, the corrections you made to finite element method or something like this? Or you yeah. just... Yes, please. Uh, it can be possible to use the numerical methods to uh, find a solution for this problem. But uh, this uh, approximation uh, enables to uh, Re reveal the effects of the uh, age conditions. So I'm not sure uh, it can be obtained the same uh, conditions from the numeric numerical solution. All right, thank you. Thank you. Let's thank the presenter. Uh, let's quickly move to the next presentation, which is going, which, is, which will be given by Tak Sanjay. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Yes, uh, you can share your screen now, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, good evening, sir. I'm Sanjay Kumar Tak, and my study, this is my presentation on the study of comparative analysis of energy absorption and for, uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you, but we don't see your presentation yet. Oh. Yes, that's right. Could, could you please make it full screen? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Can I now full screen, sir? Yes, you have 20 minutes. Good evening, sir. Uh, I am Sanjay Kumar Tak. I am presenting my study on comparative analysis of energy absorption and deformation of metallic tubes with different configuration under axial impact by the projectile. These are the outlines. The impact of transport vehicle is an unfortunate but in common occurrence. The major challenges for automotive industries is to design such vehicles which are crash worthy. Similarly, in order to absorb high energy release in containment structures such as pressure vessel energy absorption devices as metallic tubes positioned internally to take the impact actually. The use of impact energy absorber is the latest trend in the automotive industries to dissipate the energy in the event of impact. Many Many energy absorber elements are suggested by the researchers, but thin wall metallic tubes are the most popular energy absorber due to their economic significance, lighter it went and more efficiency. The energy absorption capacity will depend on the amount of plastic deformation which takes place under the axial loading. An energy absorber is a, a system that converts the totally or partially the kinetic energy into another form of energy. Energy converted is either reversible or irreversible. Reversible like energy, uh, pressure energy in compressive fluids or elastic strain energy in solids and irreversible like plastic deformation energy. A good design in case of crash worthiness is one in which mean crash force and maximum crashing distance could be maximized. The mean crash force 
mainly depends on the wall thickness of the tube. These are the objectives. To explore the influence of wall thickness with different configurations. Here, the different configurations means the comparison between monolithic and tube in tube structure in con uh, uh, two tubes in contact uh, uh, or I can say the layer tubes on the maximum axial compression of circular tube under projectile impact. To study the effect of wall thickness with the different configuration on energy absorption behavior of circular tubes under projectile impact. Numerical studies are 3D finite animate model of projectile and hollow tubes were developed using abacus. The tubes were modeled as deformable body, whereas projectile model as analytical rigid body. Johnson Cook constitutive and flexor model was used to simulate this deformation behavior of mild steel tubes. The contact between projectile and mild steel tubes were modeled using kinematic contact algorithm in Abacus. The contact between the tube and projectile were defined using the interaction. Fixed boundary conditions were applied at the rear, rear face of the tube and mass convergence study was performed to find the optimum size of element for the mass. The results were obtained in the terms of axial compression, energy absorption and residual velocity distribution and also the numerical deformation profile. Johnson Cook elastoviscoplastic material model was used to define the behavior of mild steel tubes in incorporating the numerical simulations. So here the equivalent point mysis of the John Watson Cook model is defined as in this uh, in the formula. Here you can see uh, this epsilon. This is equivalent plastic strain. This is the ratio of equivalent plastic strain rate with the uh, reference strain rate and T is the unit less parameter uh, related to temperature and T is T minus T naught divided by T mel melting minus T naught. T is the current temperature, T melt is the melting point temperature and T naught is the room temperature. Equivalent fracture strain is expressed by this formula. Here we can see uh, this sigma M divided by sigma bar is the stress triaxiality ratio and sigma m is, is strain, uh, mean strain. D1 to D5 are the material parameters determined from the different me mechanical tests as D1 to D3 are uh, 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 find by uniaxial tensile test, uh, uniaxial uh, tensile test on the notch specimens. These are the material parameters for the mild steel uh, taken from the literature modulus of elasticity, poison's ratio, density for the mild steel is 7850 kg per meter cube and A is yield strain constant and B and N are the strain hardening constants. Similarly, melting temperature here is uh, 1800 uh, and transition temperature is 293 and D1 to D5 are the fracture constant or you can say damage parameters. This is the mass convergence study. In case of monolithic uh, tube of 1.1 mm thickness, uh, we, uh, we uh, see here that uh, as the uh, element size is reducing, uh, uh, we see here that after uh, one, uh, 1 mm by 1 mm element size, the axial compression is almost constant. Similarly, in case of 1.5 mm monolithic tube, Again, the projectile impact uh, is the velocity 36 uh, meter per second. And again, we can see here that uh, after one meter, uh, one mm uh, element size, the uh, axial compression is constant. So the optimum size of element use is one mm by one mm. Yes, this is the schematic diagram of uh, experimental setup. Uh, actually, uh, for the validation of this model, uh, some experiments were, uh, were carried out. Uh, so this is the air compressor, air pressure vessel and this is 20 meter length barrel. And to catch this uh, video, uh, uh, this is a high speed camera and this is the target supporting uh, uh, stand. And 
here uh, you can see that uh, dia uh, uh, the diameter of the projectile is 92 mm length is 186 mm this is blunt nose projectile basically and this is hollow uh, circular tube of 16 mm outer dia with the uh, length of 200 mm and these uh, this is the validation uh, here we can send with the uh, increasing the impact velocity uh, the final axial deformation or we can say the axial compression is increasing but uh, if, uh, when we see uh, the actual uh, test result with the uh, predicted uh, with the numerical simulations uh, this is uh, our closely validate and uh, this is again uh, validation uh, we can see here the actual and predicted results and this is a study uh, of influence of wall thickness in case of monolithic as the thickness of wall is increasing uh, we can see here that axial deformation is reducing and energy absorption in case we can that uh, in case of lower velocities up to 50 or 60 meter per second there is no distinguished uh, effect uh, here and as the projectile impact is uh, increased, means uh, impact velocity is increasing, the axial deformation also increases. And this is uh, the case when we are using layered uh, tubes. Layered tubes means a tube in tube structure uh, within contact. So, uh, two layers of 0.5, uh, 0.55 mm and two layer of 0 0.75 mm. And similarly, uh, two layer for the equivalent thickness of 2 mm so uh, layers are 1 mm and uh, uh, we see here that also again uh, that when the thickness is increased uh, axial deformation is reducing and uh, uh, there is no distinguished effect uh, uh, in case of energy absorption here uh, this is the comparative study between the monolithic and layered tubes uh, this is the case when the uh, equivalent thickness is equal to uh, 1.1 mm uh, so here we can see uh, in case of layer tube axial deformation is higher in each uh, case of impact velocity uh, and uh, then we uh, see in the case of energy absorption here up to uh, uh, 60 uh, up to 50 meter per second the energy absorption is uh, almost similar but uh, uh, after this and we can see at up to higher velocities uh, uh, we can find that uh, in case of monolithic tubes energy absorption is higher similar case uh, for the monolithic tube 1.5 mm and same case uh, we can see here that uh, monolithic tube uh, give the better higher uh, energy absorption in case of higher velocities and uh, in other parameter axial deformation uh, in case of layer tubes are uh, comparatively higher to monolithic tube and this is the case when the monolithic uh, tube and layer tube with the equivalent thickness 2 mm and here also we can see the similar uh, results that the layer tubes are uh, with the maximum axial deformation and in energy absorption there is uh, not uh, distinguished effect initially but uh, in case of higher velocity we find that uh, monolithic tube give the better uh, energy absorption uh, this is uh, axial deformation versus velocity in case of monolithic tube uh, and this is energy absorption versus velocity uh, uh, in, in case of the monolithic tube and comparison uh, for the different monolithic tube uh, with the uh, different of uh, with the increasing thicknesses and this is uh, in case of layer uh, thickness uh, tube and uh, in equivalent thickness is, uh, is same but uh, these uh, uh, also uh, similar effect uh, we can see here that as the energy uh, the wall thickness is increasing uh, axial deformation is reducing uh, this is a, a numerical deformation profile you can see here uh, that uh, as the wall thickness is increasing the axial deformation is reducing and uh, we can see here the maximum bone mysis stress location of maximum bone mysis stress is also different and uh, this is a case of monolithic tube um, and this is the case when we compare with the uh, uh, 
net tubes or we can say the tube and tube structures uh, you can see here uh, that the axial deformation in each case uh, with compared to monolithic is, is higher and uh, one other thing we can find out that uh, uh, that the top uh, from the, this top view we can see that some uh, diamond profiles are also in the deformation model uh, the mode of deformation we can see that in case of 1.1 mm uh, thickness of wall, uh, we can see here that uh, diamond mo uh, diamond mold is also coming with the cons uh, concentric mode. Um, is the conclusion? The finite eliminate computational uh, computations were performed to study the effect of uh, thickness with the different configurations uh, to study the effect of all thickness on axial crushing and energy absorption. Um, for the validation, we see that uh, actual and predicted axial deformation in the circular tubes are closely validated. And due to axial impact of projectile, the axial deformation of circular tubes were decreasing in both cases for the monolithic and layer tubes and not distinguish effect of wall thickness in case of monolithic and bulk were noticed in case of uh, in energy absorption of circular tube. However, the energy absorption were increased in case of monolithic tube, uh, uh, in case of uh, when the velocity is higher than the 50 meter per second. These are references. Thank you for your uh, attention. Okay, well, thank you, Professor. So, we have time for questions. Okay. Question. Uh, then I have a question. Uh, what is the practical practical use of such uh, numerical experiments, and not only numerical experiments? Uh, do you encounter such uh, impact events in uh, practice? Uh, actually, sir. Uh, uh, there are some limitations in case of experimental uh, uh, tests uh, because uh, we can't find uh, uh, some things like uh, energy absorption in case of uh, projectile impact or uh, in case of drop hammer impact we can't find by uh, the energy absorption in the tubes or uh, any other uh, material like aluminum tubes uh, AL, um, just means uh, AL7075 or mild distin but uh, uh, if we want to now uh, energy absorption, we, uh, the, uh, the simulation work is better for the uh, some parameter which we can uh, uh, can't get from the experimental. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank again our presenter, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Danilo Prikashikov to be a chairperson for the next presentation because it will be given by me. That's my Thank you, sir. Absolutely, Nikita. My pleasure. Yes. Please start. Yes. I hope uh, I will be helped by our yes, by our engineer. All right, so I will fix the time. Yeah, we should not let it get. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, predicting uh, target impact strength of targets using neural networks. Uh, that this work was done together with my colleague from High School of Economics and who also works at JetBrains, kind of famous coding company. And uh, first of all, I would like to start with general discussion about simulations of impact using finite element method. Uh, if we think of this uh, approach, it's going to be one of the toughest tasks uh, among all the FDM simulations. Because here we have contact, we have uh, high strain rates, we have uh, sometimes complex material models. And uh, we also need to use some complex fracture models. So this is a very, very tough problem. And uh, 
here I, I showed uh, one of the most popular uh, equations to study fracture by Johnson Holtquist. It's the Johnson Holtquist 2 model for brittle fracture. Actually, it's just a, a part of uh, all this uh, Johnson Holtquist approach. And still, it, it already has a lot of parameters to be uh, found in experiment. So, all this thing about uh, input simulations by FEM is really complicated. And who did this? I think all of us, uh, we encountered uh, problems with uh, final element method itself. We had uh, negative volume errors, we have uh, too much penetration errors in the contact elements. So, um, it's a hard job. Of what, what I would like to say. Uh, but let's imagine that we run a company that performs FEM simulations for our customers. And uh, specifically, we do simulations of impact, uh, of uh, penetration of targets by projectiles. And we have many, many customers. And for each of them, uh, each of them is interested in uh, different uh, parameters of their problems, like uh, shape of target, material parameters, uh, velocity of the projectile, the shape of the projectile, etc. And all of them are interested in results. Uh, in our case, it's just the residual velocity of the projectile, which tells us how strong is the target. If the residual velocity of the projectile is slow, then the target is strong. So for all our customers, we should provide this information. And let's imagine that we've been on the market for a long time. So we did a lot of computations with different data combinations. Um, and we use a lot of resources for this, uh, because all, every computation requires a lot of resources. What we would like to do is to develop some kind of algorithm that would predict uh, the result basing on the knowledge we have, we have obtained uh, from the other problems. So, firstly, we would like some algorithm that would provide us the result without performing the FEM simulation itself. And it should work fast so that we, we could save our computational resources and we could lower our costs. And second, we want to uh, overcome some difficulties which are associated with the final element method. The things I was uh, talking in the previous slide, like uh, contact, bad contact behavior, like uh, mesh failings, and so on and so on. Um, so, it's probably you have noticed from the name of the presentation, we will use neural network that would uh, uh, do this stuff. But, the slide here is named the optimistic problem statement because it is very, very complicated in fact. Here we have a lot of parameters. And uh, in our work, we decided to try something very, very simple. We decided to narrow uh, the problem to simply perforated uh, targets. Uh, let's imagine that our company has one specific customer who, who uh, produces some strange targets. They are round. They have round targets, so we can use actual symmetry uh, simplification. And th those targets, they have uh, 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 they have canals inside that are concentric. So in the perforation, uh, in the actual symmetry statement, it looks like this. Yes. So we work. We decided to try uh, to predict. Uh, the results for such problems, uh, the impact strength of perforated targets. And the perforation can be uh, arbitrary. So we would like, we have some data on um, some, the number of perforations, we have results for them, and we want to predict the result for the perforation pattern, which is out of our uh, set of data. And moreover, we would like to use this trained algorithm to predict the result for the uh, preparation patterns that result into the finite element method failure. So, two goals. Make something uh, 
to predict the result without performing the calculation and to make it fast. And the second goal is to predict the result where, where we have no result at all using finite element method. Uh, well, well, we can have a result there, but we should uh, reduce the time step, we should change the material properties. So, uh, without doing all these adjustments, we want to predict results for the problematic perforation patterns. And to study uh, this problem a little bit more, in a more comprehensive way, we decided to see different resolutions of the perforation patterns. So, we have big holes on the left, smaller holes and uh, the smallest possible holes. So we have three configurations. It's four, two by 12, four by uh, 24, and eight by, uh, eight by 48. So for all three configura uh, configurations, uh, we are trying to build a model, a neural network that would give us the result based on the data we obtain using finite element method. Uh, so let's talk about how we actually get the results for these preparation patterns. We use ANSYS, the find element software, to uh, build the geometry. And we use LSDIN as a solver, uh, explicit solver. And we use Python for all the rest of the things, like automation and management of results and so on and so on. So here on the picture you can see that the symmetry axis, uh, we use the, the non-perforated layer, which is equal in all the uh, perforation configurations, just to reduce problems with contact a little bit. And we assume that our targets are constrained by the, by the round edge. So in the actual axisymmetric uh, statement, we have a constrained edge. And uh, we um, use something like a Lego, Lego strategy here. We have bricks, two types of bricks, a solid brick and a brick with hole. So, uh, and we randomly put them together, and this way we obtain the different uh, preparation configurations. Uh, these uh, bricks, they are pre-meshed. This way is the fastest way to generate this, uh, uh, the data set. So we have three types here. As you, you can see, we have uh, three types of, of three sizes of bricks, and therefore we have three types of perforation patterns. Uh, as for the fracture condition, we use uh, the fracture model proposed by. Uh, it's a mistake here. <laughs> Sorry, it's a mistake here. It should be another. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's proposed by yeah, Yuri Petrov uh, and uh, Alexander Lutkin, and it's called the incubation fracture criterion. Uh, it's, from one point of view, it's, really, it's very simple to use. Because to study uh, if we have fracture in the element or not, we just need to check this condition. And it implies uh, some structural size D. So if we have our element uh, size equal to D, then we are fine. And we also have some specific time, uh, time uh, fracture parameter, uh, which accounts for the history of stresses. Uh, and in our case, we check several areas inside our elements. Uh, we, I, I guess we check six angles here. So. Uh, we use this uh, fracture, fracture model instead of uh, Johnson Cook uh, and something more complicated. And we calibrate this model against uh, some experimental results we obtained uh, several years ago. So for the target material, we use uh, organic glass. And uh, the as, as in the experiments that we conducted. And for the projectile, we use a steel cylinder. So we adjust this two-dimensional, uh, our two-dimensional numerical scheme uh, for these uh, experimental results. And the only thing that we had to adjust was the incubation parameter, which appeared to be 6.4 microseconds. 
And this, uh, this set of parameters gives us really good uh, fit with the experiments. So our base configuration without perforation behaves like uh, the plate in the experiments. That was the, the idea. And then we introduce perforation into our plate and see what happens. So this uh, dependence of the residual velocity on the uh, in initial velocity of the impactor is for the base configuration where there are no holes at all. And we see that we fit quite well and we even managed to uh, get the threshold velocity too. All right, so what about the numerical uh, the approach which is based on uh, neural networks? Uh, we take our perforation pattern and we encode it using just the matrix made of zeros and unities. And then we put it through the neural network. Uh, the neural network here should be uh, understood just like a very complicated function that maps uh, our input, which is the configuration pattern, to the result, which is the residual velocity of the project. Pattern. So uh, it has a lot of a lot of parameters. This function is, and so we use our data set to uh, found, find the best fit of this function. So it could fit our uh, numerical results in the best way. Uh, we checked two variants of the neural networks, uh, two architectures. The first one to, is to the left is the classic one, which is called a fully connected network. And it is what should be understand, understood here is that um, it, it looks at the, our part, uh, preparation pattern globally. It uh, sees how this hole here influences uh, how it is connected to the, this hole on the on the top two. So on the, all the holes are connected. That's why it's called the fully connected network. And the second type of the architecture we used was the convolutional network, and we had very high hopes for this because this type of models are usually used in the image recognition problems. And it's, you can see our problem is really close because we consider these preparation patterns, we could consider them as images. Uh, and the convolutional neural network, it seeks for some specific um, combinations of pixels, or in our case, holes and uh, solid cells, so that uh, it just trains itself to find some specific uh, patterns inside of our configuration uh, in our perforator plate. Uh, it, so this left one is a global one, and the right one is not global one. It looks for local patterns. That that is the main difference between them. If we uh, don't go deep into technical things. So anyway, we expected the right one to work the best for our problem. But uh, so we have our configurations, we have our data set, we have our neural networks, and uh, let's turn to results. Actually, does it work or not? Before starting with the impact problem, we decided to see what happens in a very, very simple problem. A uh, problem of uh, static deflection of the plane. Uh, to the left, you see a very um, coarse uh, a perforated plate with a very coarse resolution. So I think everybody can say if, where it will deflect, to left or right, if we pull by the top. Uh, Obviously, it will deflect to left because we see two holes here, and we naturally understand uh, what is what's going to happen. But uh, th things are getting much more complicated for us as humans if we look at this perforation pattern to in the middle. So here, we actually can't say what will happen. But uh, of course, the finite element method can tell us, and then the neural network also can manage with this problem. So it works. Uh, this test problem showed us that the approach we are trying to use will work. 
at least uh, for very, very simple problem of the plate reflection. And what is interesting here, that the best model, at least uh, with, for the accuracy and simplicity, was the linear model, which is, in fact, a model of linear regression. So the simplest model for this problem was the best. Uh, and the convolutional neural networks just failed uh, completely for this problem. And that surprised us a lot. Uh, for the simplest problem, like to the left, it worked well. But for much more complicated problems where the perforation patterns were high, had high resolutions, it failed completely. Uh, it's quite understandable, in fact, because what is important in this test problem is uh, how the holes are distributed on the left and on the right. And uh, the convolutional neural network, it, as I said, looks for local patterns. It doesn't know if uh, what corresponds to the hole on the left from the right side. So for this type of problem, the fully connected network is much more preferable. Uh, so let's turn to the results of our main problems. Uh, as you can see, we, we studied uh, some uh, configurations of the neural networks and chose uh, the two best. Uh, the, and chose the configurations, uh, the architectures uh, that uh, uh, were all were simple, were both simple and were enough accurate. That were the fully connected connected network with two layers and convolutional network with four layers. And uh, here we studied how many actual data you need to feed these networks so they could work uh, correctly and give us good results. Uh, for the lower resolution preparation patterns, uh, you don't need a lot of results. After a thousand of uh, results in your data set, you get very accurate predictions of the velocity of the project there. Uh, for the middle uh, perforation resolution, of course, you, you need more. It's about 15,000. And for the high resolution perforation patterns, you need quite a lot. You need uh, around 100,000 solutions of uh, the problem. Uh, and yes, after you get these solutions, actually, the neural network predicts the result quite well. We get the accuracy up to 95 percent and it is fast uh, if we for a single solution of using finite element methods you need uh, roughly a minute and of course the neural network works instantly but of course you need all the data <laughs> to train it uh, but after you train it uh, you are done you can predict it instantly for example if you want to uh, implement for the web use you can use uh, the neural network instead of uh, the complete computation, because when you if you would like to try uh, to use it through the internet, the finite element method will be most unusable because of the delays. So the next result. Sorry, I just can't change the slide. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, this here you can see uh, the predictions for uh, different preparation patterns and preparation resolution. Thank you. Uh, you see that uh, we feed quite well uh, the neural network results fit quite well the fine element results. And what is interesting that for uh, lower velocity of the projectile, we have some dots, we have some results that fall uh, down, that fall beyond the uh, level of the base configuration, meaning that we, some of the preparation patterns provide higher strength than the base configuration, which is quite interesting, at least for the 95 uh, meters per second projectile velocity. For the higher velocity, we studied two velocities, 95 meters per second and uh, 200 meters per second. For the higher velocity, there are no such configurations. 
uh, and the neural net network actually is able to catch this attack. So, uh, since we have a trained network and since we have these uh, some interesting results, they are purely numerical results, and we actually don't know if it will be confirmed in the experiment, for example. But from the purely numerical point of view, uh, we build a, a, a and not complicated uh, algorithm for the optimization, uh, so-called genetic optimization algorithm, that used uh, our trained neural network to build some configurations that provided uh, lower res residual velocity of the projectile comparing to the base uh, configuration, where, which had no faults at all. So you can see that uh, this uh, special configuration it redirects uh, the cracks instead of one single crack uh, it generates two cracks and then uh, a big a big uh, fragment is generated which slows down the projectile so it appears that some uh, some configurations provide higher uh, protection comparing to a solid target which is quite interesting, but again, it should be uh, taken with caution. At least uh, three-dimensional simulations should be performed, and finally, I think we need to <laughs> test and experiment because for this, uh, th this example is very simple. It's we have actual symmetry here and a lot of simplifications. Uh, and the last result we got. Uh, was the result for the failed configurations. Uh, among the configurations we used to train our neural networks, there were configurations where we couldn't get the result. Uh, some of the elements were distorted uh, heavily, and uh, for example, we also had some contact problems. So we couldn't get the results using fine element methods. But yes, we could tune it a little bit, for example, to reduce the time step, but then uh, the solution would take uh, consider considerably more time. Uh, so in our case, that wasn't the way. But we could uh, use our train network to predict the result of these so-called bad configurations. This is interesting, as we can now uh, get the results for the things we couldn't get the result in a classic way. Uh, but uh, there, there was a one uh, question we were interested in. Uh, we tried our networks uh, if they could predict if the configuration will fail or not. And they couldn't. Uh, from one point of view, it's bad. Because you well you can't predict if it's a bad configuration or if it's a good one, but that means that um, the configurations that lead to failure they don't have any special features, and uh, they don't they are not grouped into a special class of configurations uh, from the point of view of our neural network model. Uh, this is good. That means that uh, they. These configurations, they simply share features with all the rest configurations in the data set. And that means that uh, we can expect high accuracy uh, for the residual velocity predictions. And actually, we tested some of these bad configurations. Uh, some of them were enhanced by the time step reduction, and we actually got the results for some of them and we predicted the results using our neural networks and we got quite high accuracy uh, up to 96 percent for uh, the higher velocity case uh, so what we learned from our study yeah, firstly well yes the neural networks can be used to predict uh, the results of fine element simulations of course if you have enough of result to train them. Uh, sometimes this number can be quite big. For example, for the case for the higher resolution preparation pattern, uh, which is 8 by 48 uh, cells, you know, uh, more than 100,000 uh, solutions were required. 
But uh, after, if, for example, you run a lot of solutions all day long, probably you already have these results. So after you get this uh, massive of uh, numerical results, you are done. You can further. You can. You don't need final element method. Uh, you just lose a little bit of accuracy. But for example, for prototyping, that can be useful. Uh, we also learned that uh, despite some similarities in the problems, for example, uh, in ge geometric similarities, uh, we, uh, the type of the neural network heavily depends on the physics of the problem. In our case, we had static deflection problem and we have an impact problem. And uh, uh, the different neural networks, uh, different uh, architectures work well for one and uh, they completely fail for another. So for e each case should be studied separately. Uh, we also see that the trained neural network is a good tool to overcome some difficulties of the finite element method, like convergence difficulties, like stability difficulties. Uh, and of course, the optimization thing, uh, we can use the neural networks to optimize some shapes or probably some parameters, etc. But again, I, I put uh, this scheme from the first slide uh, here too. This all is correct just for our narrow case of the perforated targets. But we don't know if it will work for real problems, where, for example, we'll have different material properties, or, for example, where we'll have different projectile velocities. Uh, so there is a lot of <laughs> work to be done here. Uh, but for these uh, toy problems, the results are quite good. Probably, I would say, even promise. That's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nikita. Thanks a lot. Very interesting talk. I guess uh, we have time for one quick question, please, if there is a question. I have a question. Please. Um, I'm sorry, it has to go out here. Yeah, no, 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 the camera. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question is to you. Now, you said you had to train and use your neural network to get more accurate results. Tell me, can you accelerate uh, your process of teaching the neural network if you had access to more data points? Um, not accelerate. Uh, the accelerate. Well, well um, we feel that our networks are already quite saturated. So we actually we had more data than we showed here. So we are getting uh, the best results for the architectures we use. Uh, probably we the architectures of our networks wasn't optimal at all. So uh, here uh, the, the, I have some graphs here showing you. Yes, these graphs. Yeah, these graphs. Yeah. Um, Accelerate, you mean the teaching acceleration? Yeah. In our case, no. no. Yeah. Just, we, we, we have a, a, uh, an array of data and we train it, and uh, the train speed won't be accelerated if we give from more points. Mm -hmm. uh, the, probably the optimization can be done better if we, have, if we use uh, so called reinforced learning and that sort of stuff, but we haven't done it yet, because the optimization was like a side effect of what we have done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, I just wanted to add a comment that I think uh, as well, I would be on the cautious side here because, um, well, of course, it, a lot depends on the physics of the problem. So as far as I understand it, if the network well, if the situation is well within the coverage of the knowledge that the network has gained, then it would be okay. But we know there are sometimes problems that you change it a little bit, but the result changed quite substantially. And I guess with these cases, the neural network approach would not really work well. But we'll see. Of course, there's a lot of 
future work here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Nikita. So I, I guess I'm passing back on to you now. Yes, uh, so yes, I did my role there. <laughs> so, uh, next presentation uh, will be given by Chukinska and Natalia. She is here offline, so um, we should somehow close and give my presentation. I'm sorry, can you please? Can have a TV. Would you say it right here? So we will see you. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So the phenomenon when the uh, cylinder can elongate or shorten it due to the torsion was um, experimentally discovered and described uh, by Boynton at the beginning of the 20th century. But the quantitative expression of this uh, effect was uh, too small. But uh, when we speak about like uh, nonlinear theory of elasticity and a lot of uh, uh, mechanical models that are already known, we can uh, expect more interesting results. However, the manufacturing uh, of the precision measuring uh, um, equipment and also in uh, experimental determination of uh, uh, mechanical uh, parameters of the some type of uh, um, isotropic models the point in effect, uh, yeah, it is necessary to take into account. Also, it is well known that the uh, isolated defects like uh, screw dislocation and uh, edge dislocation affects to the uh, torsion and elongation or shortening the un uh, or unloaded cylinder. Um, but uh, there is no any uh, the, the information about how uh, um, can, uh, the uh, uh, cylinder will uh, uh, behave uh, behaves if uh, the one of the mechanical parameter will be inhomogeneous. So that's that's uh, the leads to me to uh, to do this research. So here you can see the sum of content of my research. Uh, there there will be similar inverse representation of the deformation for twisted cylinder due to the disclination formation. Also, uh, there is a constitutive relation for hyperelastic, um, isotropic, and more importantly, compressible type material, equilibrium equations, uh, specific potential, potential energies that uh, was selected for this research. Also, the modeling of homogeneity found their value problems for these specific uh, material models and some numerical results uh, of the solution uh, for these boundary value problems. So here you can see the semi-inverse representation of deformation, which includes the kappa, uh, this uh, disclination parameter, and also psi, this uh, angle of twist. Uh, P of R is a known function of, of a radial displacement of the point of cylinder, and gamma we, uh, will be follows to the elongation or shortening of our cylinder. The wedge disclination appears uh, at the cylinder in following way. So uh, a cylinder um, is cut along its axis, and uh, uh, then either the uh, sector of the cylinder uh, is uh, added or removed in it. So here you can see the constitutive relation for the isotropic compressible material, which uh, which rep uh, is represented in um, you know, viola stress tensor uh, terms. I see this is a deformation gradient, and uh, G, this is a Cauchy-Gring strain measure. The equilibrium equations in general when boundary conditions uh, also are presented in the terms of Viola stress tensor. Uh, so th for this research, we're selected a specific pot potential energy 
uh, which include harmonic type material model and Volatsikor material model, uh, which uh, reduced to simplified uh, one and hypothetical one. All these uh, um, mechanical properties are constant except only one, mu. And how, uh, that's how I can uh, model the um, inhomogeneity in our uh, mechanical properties of the cylinder. So I selected like linear inhomogeneity and exponential homogeneity. Uh, this is dependence from the uh, radius of our cylinder, as you can see. So here, the, um, for this type of a problem, uh, 3D boundary value problem reduced to uh, boundary value problem for one uh, differential equation of uh, ordinary differential equation of second rank and boundary conditions mean the absence any stresses on the lateral surfaces of our cylinder. And the, uh, to follow uh, for the elongation or shot in our uh, unloaded uh, cylinder uh, or, or by uniaxial load, we also express our uniaxial load in terms of, of payload resistance here. So for um, harmonic type material, the boundary value problem includes uh, the we angle itself in the uh, um, differential equations, in boundary conditions, and also in the condition of uh, load-free cylinder. For hypothetical Blatsoko material, the only differential equation uh, for unknown theory of R uh, includes uh, the twist and angle. And for simplified Blatsoko material, only uh, um, twist and angle is in the condition of uh, load free cylinder or unloaded cylinder. So here you can see uh, some numerical uh, results for harmonic type material when uh, uh, inhomogeneity is linear function, when uh, mu zero and mu one, um, like uh, as, as shown on the slide, for different uh, angle of twisting and for different uh, thickness of, of the cylinder's wall. There is a uh, like a, a shortening or elongation about half a percent. This is like small and not so interesting for us. But for hypothetical Blatsko material, when I use uh, linear and exponential and exponential inhomogeneity, the elongation or shortening for this type uh, due to the disclination also formation will be. Uh, all, about two and a half percent. It's already interesting, I think. And for simplified blood cycle material, when uh, the ratio between the mu zero and mu one it's not so big, like uh, in, in one order, the um, elongation also and shortening will be uh, between three uh, percent and seven percent. Um, I um, also uh, have to point out that this is for a dimensionless hollow cylinder. Uh, also, uh, there are results for uh, ratio in two orders between mu zero and mu one, uh, and the elongation will be between uh, two and a half and six and a half percent. And uh, for also this type of um, homogeneity, the elongation can be um, up to the 12 percent already. Percent and uh, when it's exponential homogeneity, due to the uh, disclination formation and due to the different uh, twist and angle, there, uh, there there will be elongation or shortening between three and eleven and half a percent, which is already interesting, uh, in my opinion. So this there are some conclusions of my study: the appearance of disclination change the length of the cylinder. Therefore, the shortening or elongation depends not only on the type of disclination, as I said before, the torsion can be included uh, uh, at the boundary value problem itself, not only uh, expression for the uh, absence of the uh, uniaxial board. The point in effect is insulin, but not, uh, not only ratio of mu uh, on the outer and inner, inter, inner walls of the cylinder, but also and the type of homogeneity, as well as uh, the thickness of the wall itself. And value of deformation can be up to 
Who paid the for your nation? So, questions, please. Huh? Well, I don't know. Hmm. No, no. Moderators, can I have a quick yeah. okay. Any questions from the online colleagues? I don't think so. There is no question. Oh, oh. okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, thank you then. Let's move to the next speaker. Thank you. Alexander Sergei. I'm here. One second, please. You see my screen. Not yet. I push on green button. Green button, right? Yes. Can can I start your presentation? Okay. You can do that. Sergey, can I start your presentation? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, please do it. Oh, do you see it now? I can see something. Yes, yes, you see it now. Okay, 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 okay. If you don't write, just make it full screen. Okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everybody. So my name is Sergey Alexandrov. I represent two organizations: Institute for Program Mechanics, Russian Academy of Science, Moscow, and Samar University. Both are from Russia. And, uh, the title of my presentation is Singular Solution Plasticity. So my area of research is rigid plastic models. And today I'm going to describe, describe uh, uh, discuss three models and the behavior of solutions near special frictional interfaces. I start with rigid plastic solids. The uh, general theory applies to any yield condition, but for simplicity, I will uh, discuss Mises yield condition. So the constitutive equations of the model are shown on the slide. So the first equation is uh, Mises yield condition. The second one is its associated flow rule. So S is deviatoric stress. Sigma zero is uh, yield stress and tension in the case of rigid plastic model it's a constant and C is strain rate. Then I need to consider a special friction law. It is usually called the maximum friction law. It's illustrated on this slide. Uh, according to this law, the friction stress at sliding is equal to shear yield stress. So friction stress equal to shear yield stress. And again, in the case of rigid perfectly plastic solids, it's a constant. And it is the maximum possible shear stress that can be supported by the material, it's by, by constitutive equations. Then it's convenient to choose a local Cartesian coordinate system shown on the slide. So, and, um, so U is a velocity vector, then we choose y-axis coinciding with velocity vector, so z is orthogonal uh, to the friction surface, and x is orthogonal to y and z. 
then the st uh, friction stress is opposite to uh, y axis. So in this local coordinate system, the, the maximum friction law can be written in this form. So the stress yz equal to uh, shear yield stress. So this is our boundary condition. Now we consider the state, the state of stress and strain rates at any point of maximum friction surface. So this condition is just from the previous slide. It is a boundary condition. Then one can substitute this stress into the yield criterion. Uh, in this case, we have this term is cancelled and we have sum of squares equal to zero because this, this term is cancelled by this one. So sum of squares equal to zero. That's why all the atomic stresses vanish except for YZ. Then we have to consider the associate flow rule. It is shown here again. So if, you, if one substitute this derivative stresses into this rule, then there are two options. So one option is that all strain rates components except this one vanish. And the second option is that lambda approach infinity. And uh, I will show in the next slide that in most cases, uh, this option is valid. And that's why the solutions may be called singular solutions. Then the simplest example to show that, uh, that uh, lambda should approach infinity near maximum friction surface is to consider axisymmetric deformation. In this case, one of the normal strain rate doesn't involve any derivatives, it's just radial velocity divided by radius. Then if velocity is not zero, then in general, radial velocity is not zero, and then hoop strain rate is not zero, then one of these equations is not satisfied. Because all normal strain rates are here. So one of them is not zero, one of these equations is not satisfied. Therefore, we must assume that lambda approach infinity. And um, it is known from general theory that lambda is proportional to equivalent strain rate. Therefore, if lambda approach infinity, then equivalent strain rate approach infinity in the vicinity of the maximum pressure surface. Then uh, actually, if one check any of classical solutions in plasticity, such as compression of a layer between rigid plates, rigid plates given by Prank and Hill, or planar flow through an infinite channel, as well given by Nadai and Hill, or axiometric flow through an infinite channel given by Shield, then the authors didn't show that, but it's very easy to show using asymptotic analysis that all of these equations satisfy uh, this condition. So that's that, that's why in the in most cases the equivalent strain rate approach infinity in the vicinity of maximum friction surface. And I will skip detailed analysis. It's very routine, just as much analysis of all equations, including the equilibrium equations. But using this analysis, it's possible to show that the exact asymptotic representation the representation of the equivalent strain rate in the vicinity of maximum friction surface is shown here, and the Z approach to zero. Then it is a square root of distance to the friction surface. And this Ke can be called the strain rate intensity factor by analogy to stress intensity factor and elasticity. It's because its value controls the behavior of equivalent strain rate in a narrow layer near a frictional interface. So this result uh, was based on the following assumptions, uh, very natural. So velocities are bounded at the friction surface, in surface derivatives are bounded at the friction surface, and functions may be expanded in power series near the friction surface. So under these conditions and using um, any guilt conditions possible to show that equivalent strain rate follows this, uh, uh, this asymptotic representation near the maximum friction surface. As I said before, so Ke may be called strain rate intensity factor. And uh, an applied aspect of this research is that a thin layer 
whereas the property are quite different from the property in the bulk, usually generated near friction surfaces in, in uh, metal forming process. And uh, these properties uh, are usually affected by equivalent strain rate. But the direct use of equations that connects uh, parameters that characterize material properties and um, and equivalent strain rate is impossible because strain rate approach infinity. Therefore, the main idea here is to replace equivalent strain rate with strain rate intensity factor. And to this end, of course, necessary to develop a new set of constitutive equations to connect equivalent strain rate intensity factor and parameters that characterize material properties in this um, thin layer. And uh, so on. the second model is um, the double shared model or its personal model. And uh, I will skip all my discussions, uh, all details about about the final, uh, about how to get the final result. I just uh, introduce the model. Uh, it's based on more Coulomb yield criterion. So it is case cohesion, phase friction, and uh, incompressibility equation. And this is from classic law rule. The uh, so psi is orientation of the major principal stress relative to alpha line. In this equation, this system of equations is an arbitrary orthogonal coordinate system. So psi is orientation of major principal stress relative to alpha line. So this is a model proposed by Spencer. Uh, the difference from the previous model is that this model is hyperbolic. So and the equations uh, and characteristic equations for stress and velocity coincide. And in this case, uh, uh, it's necessary to use a different formulation of the maximum friction law. The formulation is that uh, that uh, an envelope of characteristics coincide with friction surface. If this this law is accepted, then the result is absolutely the same as in the case of rigid uh, perfectly plastic solids. So, equivalent strain rate approaching infinity according to this law near the friction surface. And the last model is uh, a viscoplastic model. It is very similar to the first model. The difference is that sigma y now is not a constant, but it depends on the current strain rate. And um, the result is restricted to uh, the, uh, the, the, the function sigma y given by this equation. So sigma s is constant. It is a saturation stress. So it's assumed that uh, that um, uh, that sigma y approach sigma s as equivalent strain rate approach infinity. So it is shown here. So it is uh, so in the vicinity of friction surface, it's assumed that phi follows this rule. And, uh, A, beta, and delta are positive. Then if you assume that uh, the, that that uh, your, uh, your stress satisfy this equation, then the final result is again almost the same as before. So if bet is equal to less than two, then we get absolutely the same result. Uh, bet is involved here in the asymptotic expression of phi near uh, as equivalent strain approaches the unit. And if bet is between one and two, then the asymptotic representation of current strain rate is slightly different. Bet is now is involved here. And if bet is less than one, then no sticking is possible. Well, this model is like, it gives slightly like more complicated result. Conclusions. So the current strain rate approach infinity with special frictional interfaces, maximum friction surface. And um, so I believe that uh, theory similar, formal similar to that in linear elastic fracture mechanics can be developed and then used to predict evolution of material properties in a narrow layer near frictional uh, interfaces. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you know what should I do? I should check. I should check. No, no questions online. Uh, then I have a little question. Uh, in fracture, in, in 
you mentioned fracture mechanics. Uh, sometimes you need to use uh, not only the first term, but the second one, uh, for example, for moving cracks or something like this. Are there, what do you think about your case? Is there, are there any problems where you would need uh, uh, more precise asymptotic behavior, for example, with two terms? Uh, it is yeah, well, it is not directly re related to asymptotic analysis. It is possible to get as many terms as you want, but it's question to the next constitutive equation that should connect equivalent strain rate and material properties. But I don't have this equation yet. But you think that it, it would be usable? I mean, it would be useful to get the second term for some problems? Well, I, I'm still not sure about the first term. Ah, okay. 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 Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, please close the screen sharing. Okay, I'll try. It's not easy. I know. It's okay. Okay. Done. Uh, the next presentation will be given by Dr. Ever. Yeah. See? Please share your screen, and uh, you have 20 minutes. Yeah, in just a moment. Dear colleagues, can you see my presentation? Not yet. Not yet. Not it's okay. Right now, it's okay now. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Nikita. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, I would like to be brief and uh, save a couple of minutes uh, at this hot day. And I would like to present our work, which uh, was performed in St. Petersburg State University by a group of <coughs> authors, uh, and uh, which is a small part of big project that devoted to, uh, <coughs> uh, to development of microstructural model of uh, functional and mechanical uh, behavior of shape memory alloys. Today, shape memory alloys are not uh, something uh, unusual, uh, like it was uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, and now they <coughs> found their application in different uh, uh, fields of uh, technique uh, and uh, even in textile, uh, uh, which is especially actual uh, now in St. Petersburg, how you can see, and, and uh, even uh, even. Perseverance has uh, uh, wheels which are weaved from titanium nickel shape memory wires. So it's not something unusual. But uh, when we are talking about shape memory alloys, we usually think about uh, titanium nickel alloys. Uh, and uh, it, it is very interesting interesting material and uh, the, the, the material which has excellent properties but not uh, all the time uh, sometimes we need uh, <coughs> different temperatures of uh, different characteristic temperatures sometimes we need different uh, uh, hysteresis mechanical or temperature hysteresis so we need other type of materials and uh, now uh, uh, one of the interesting problem which uh, 
which uh, is trying to be solved by different scientists, is uh, uh, using different type of shape memory alloys. And copper-based shape memory alloys are very uh, promising in this uh, field. And uh, the material under my uh, uh, review, copper, aluminum, beryllium shape memory alloys are one of these materials. The copper aluminum aluminum beryllium alloys exhibit shape memory properties because of a thermoelastic martensitic transformation. The martensitic transformation can be induced by cooling or by application of mechanical stress. On cooling, the spontaneous transformation occurs without a macroscopic change of shape with the formation of 24 self-accommodated martensite variants, and it begins at temperature martensitic start. Martensite can be also induced by application of mechanical stress, tension or compression, or <clears throat> the beta phase producing a microscopic change of shape. On removing the load, a hysteretic loop is formed and the strain can be almost full, fully recovered, leading to the pseudo elastic uh, behavior. The pseudo elastic cycles exhibit Exhibit hysteresis. I'm sorry. Exhibit hysteresis. <coughs> uh, intention due to the dissipation of mechanical energy. Previous studies on such type of alloys uh, with small addition of trillion have demonstrated that they exhibit the pseudo elastic behavior at room temperature associated to better to uh, the better to eight uh, rhomboid site transformation with high strain recoverability and higher stability ranges of the beta phase respect to other copper based alloys. For these reasons, these alloys are promising for applications as passive dampers, especially for civil engineering applications in uh, damping and vibration control. They also demonstrate uh, accumulation of strain at cooling uh, under the stress and uh, shape memory effect at heating under the same stress. So they are promising for different type of technical applications. And uh, uh, to success uh, uh, using of such materials, we need some models uh, to predict their uh, behavior. and. Uh, all the model uh, describing uh, the behavior of shape memory alloys can be divided to two or three if we take in account, into account uh, models, ab, ab initio models. Uh, but most usually we, we say about two types of models, uh, uh, microscopic and uh, macroscopic and, and um, microstructural or macrostructural models. And there are uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages in uh, both type of these models. And I am going to talk about uh, <clears throat> microstructural models. And uh, it has uh, uh, the advantages. It takes into account structure of material and specific mechanisms of an elastic formation and matricitic transformation uh, in these materials. It, natural formulation of the loss in this uh, model are in tensor form, so it's naturally 3D model, and it is to add other deformation process into consideration. And uh, but everything in this life has to be paid for and it has uh, its uh, disadvantages. Uh, it's difficult to determine uh, the values of material constants and uh, uh, <coughs> there are many material constants, not just a couple of constants, but uh, uh, <coughs> rather big. Uh, and uh, we also need an averaging procedure to obtain the microscopic deformation. And uh, uh, in frames of such uh, micro, microstructural 
uh, model, we can, we, we have uh, an experience in description of functional properties of titanium nickel shape memory alloys of uh, ferrum based uh, shape memory alloys. And now we tried to uh, describe uh, behavior of copper based shape memory alloys with uh, beta to uh, 18R metensthetic transformation. And a couple of words about this uh, type of uh, model. All calculations uh, were carried out in the forms, in, in the frames of uh, model. In this model, two structural levels are considered. The representative volume consists of <coughs> Grains characterized by their crystallographic representations. Total deformation tensor of any grain is resolved into a light, thermal, and uh, uh, <coughs> phase uh, uh, due to uh, phase transformation components. And we also took into account microplastic uh, deformation, which uh, occurs. Uh, <coughs> near the uh, growing metensitic crystals. Uh, mm -hmm. Deformation of the representative volume is calculated by averaging of the grain deformation on the microscopic level inside the grain. The austenite phase and uh, N12 uh, crystallographically equivalent orientation variants of the metensite phase are distinguished the grain deformation uh, tensor uh, <coughs> or representative volume uh, can be obtained by averaging on above all the grain formations uh, over all the grains. And uh, phase strain uh, <coughs> Uh, and it's uh, the special part of uh, deformation, which is unusual for uh, common materials like uh, steels and uh, uh, common uh, copper alloys and aluminum alloys and other alloys. And uh, this first uh, deformation of a grain is supposed to be the average over the matensite variants and uh, is uh, uh, equal to 12. And here, D, N, is the base deformation of the nth variant of Martin site. The procedure of calculation of the evolution of internal variables. T, N uh, <coughs> is a big question, but it, it's not a question of my presentation. And uh, the question of my presentation is this matrix DN, which is uh, the band deformation for uh, a one variant of metensitic transformation. We also took into account, as I said, microplastic <coughs> strain, which is proportional to the uh, deviator of uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> DN, this band deformation. So the band deformation is a very important parameter and we need to uh, calculate it uh, according to the specific uh, features of this uh, uh, beta to D or beta or DO3 to 18R rhomboid drug <coughs> Phase. On the uh, left side, uh, we, you can see the structure of high uh, temperature base of copper, aluminum, beryllium, uh, uh, beryllium uh, alloy, and it's uh, ordered alloy. Uh, I, I should say that. Well, <coughs> Beryllium is just about 0.04 percent atomic percent, but this 0.04 uh, atomic percent allow to avoid brittleness of uh, uh, copper-based shape memory alloy uh, polycrystals and uh, 
allow us to uh, obtain uh, studio elasticity and uh, uh, transformation plasticity and shape memory effect. So we need to calculate this matrix and we uh, <coughs> use for, for calculation and we use uh, the scheme of the O3 transformation described in uh, Funakuba and it's interesting that the mechanism wo was described, but uh, the matrix wasn't uh, calculated. Uh, um, but we, we need it, and we we've done it. The transformation in the system is considered of two steps. First step, first step is. O of uh, parent austenitic phase and uh, uh, according to uh, uh, scheme of the transformation uh, we, we know uh, which uh, <coughs> uh, para, uh, latest para, uh, distance uh, changes due to matrix transformation and using uh, x-ray data obtained uh, by different groups of authors, we calculated these uh, relative elongations and uh, contractions, and uh, uh, we also uh, uh, calculated uh, change of uh, angle uh, <coughs> inside the potentitic uh, uh, phase and it occurs to be uh, near the uh, uh, angle <coughs> which is uh, uh, near to 60 degrees which is common for closed packed uh, structures the second uh, I see on the plane 110 original plane across by the vector S. And here you can see scheme of uh, this uh, here. And uh, using these two steps, we calculated uh, the deformation gradient uh, matrix. Uh, uh, we, of course, we took into account uh, change of basic vectors and we calculated this tensor uh, knowing uh, <coughs> epsilon one and epsilon two calculated in accordance with uh, x-ray data and then we calculated the green lagrange deformation tensor matrix and then we used this uh, green lagrange deformation matrix uh, to estimate uh, so-called uh, crystallographic resource of uh, the matensitic transformation. It's the uh, uh, biggest value of the deformation which can be obtained uh, due to matensitic transformation when uh, all the uh, crystal, uh, all the <coughs> crystal uh, change uh, its form uh, due to <coughs> in, in, in the most uh, uh, perfect uh, uh, condition and it, it's the maximum uh, value of deformation and now we know that crystallographic resource of uh, this uh, transformation is about 12 percent on uh, tension and about uh, eight percent on contraction. And uh, of course, we tried to uh, apply our uh, model uh, uh, using this calculated uh, deformation tensor to uh, uh, modeling of uh, different uh, exper <coughs> experiment. We verified our model using experimental data data unfortunately I, I i didn't type the reference but uh, uh, here we can see uh, 
surrealistic, uh, surrealistic uh, behavior of our alloy, uh, black line, it's experimental line and red lines are calculate, <coughs> results of calculation. And uh, we also can see uh, two wave, so-called two wave shape memory uh, effect, uh, which after five and 10 cycles of preliminary training, uh, preliminary training, it's process of uh, cooling under the stress and heating uh, under the same stress. And then uh, after five or 10 <coughs> cycles of such prelim preliminary uh, training, uh, our uh, sample was unloaded and cooled and uh, heated without stress and demonstrated accumulation and uh, uh, <coughs> restore of uh, the deformation. And we can see rather good correspondence between our calculated data and results of experiment. And uh, uh, to <coughs> so we uh, make, uh, we can make some conclusions. Uh, of course, we, of course we have uh, a good uh, tool for simulation of all basic deformation effects of metastatic elasticity, including phase deformation and accumulation of irreversible strain at mechanical cycling, loading, and thermal cycling, and not only for titanium nickel alloy, but other type of alloys. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> specifically for copper, aluminium, and beryllium alloy, and the quantitative agreement of the simulation result is experimental data. Data confirms the <coughs> correctness of the assumption made about the mechanisms underlying the deformation effects. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Not so much, maybe what's here. <laughs> so we have uh, time for a question. It, it was a long day, so <laughs> I, I think. Uh, yes. I think. A long and very hot day. And a very hot day, yeah, yeah. And our, our clothes is not shaped memory, so so <laughs> we need to do something. Thank, thank, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Let's move then to the last speech of today's section. Uh, it will be given by Mohit Bish. Yes, if I'm right. So. Use your time, please. Hello. Am I audible too? Uh, we can hear you. It's fine. OK. So, a very good evening to all. I am Mohit. I would like to start my presentation on numerical study of ultra high performance concrete with RST model to predict the response of concrete miners to ballistic impact. With the advancement in the computer and computer technologies, it is now possible for researchers to predict the details of failure patterns in concrete targets, which includes following sizes and depth of both impact and scabbing craters, crack initiation, propagation, and distribution. These numerical uh, simulations are very uh, useful when the condition such as range, velocity, or impact angle lies outside of the laboratory's limits. This uh, numerical model generally involves strength model, damage model, and equation of state. But uh, this part involves experimental study. In 1992, a researcher called Hanchuk performed a uh, perforation test with slab 140 megapascal unconfined compressive stone. Uh, the component density for 140 megapascal was these. It was non-steel fiber, high performance concrete. The slab were 610, 610 by 178 thick. 
and six layer of reinforcement were used having 5.69 mm diameter of rebar uh, and these slabs were impacted by this projectile having half kg in mass and having diameter as 25.4 mm with ogive nose having three caliber radius head the experimental setup was like this a 30 mm smooth bore powder gun launched with half kg given nose projectile with a striking velocity is uh, ranging between 300 to 1100 meter per second the target was located 3.66 meter from the end of the gun barrel and the striking velocity was obtained by interrupting the three laser diode system uh, whereas residual velocities were measured by x ray photographs and it was observed in this experiment that the effect of striking the reinforcement had a very negligible effect the perforation data for the ballistic test were like this and these are various several impact velocities and these are corresponding residual velocities and these tests are simulated in the numeric uh, fem model and in that model the uh, rst model is used in rst model the equation of state uh, says that actually it to divide the pressure and volumetric strain in two reason elastic and inelastic reason in this inelastic reason or plastic reason it is subdivided into compaction reason sorry for uh, porous reason and compacted reason this porous reason start at a pressure value corresponding to the pore crush pressure below which the model is elastic this reason is elastic beyond this this is plastic and pore crush pressure on the initiation initiation of pore collapse a significant reduction in the effective bulk modulus is observed because of change in slope elastic having this slope and when it uh, crosses this crush uh, crush uh, pressure the slope gets changed because of this the bulk modulus effective bulk, bulk modulus gets reduced moreover an internal variable alpha which represent the porosity of the material which decreases with increasing pressure and make the loading process irreversible unloading beyond the pore press pressure occurs along the current elastic stiffness and will result in the permanent volumetric strain subsequent reloading occurs along the unloading curve when the pressure reaches to the compaction pressure the material is assumed fully compacted that means at this point the porosity gets equals to 1 and strength model it is expressed in terms of three states initial st uh, initial elastic yield surface failure surface and third one is residual surface failure surface is formed from material parameters including the compressive tensile and shear strength of the concrete Uh, subsequently the initial yield surface is formed from user input fraction of the failure surface along the tensile compressive and uh, shear meridian additionally it includes a cap this cap that closes at the current pore press pressure this part takes care of the crushing of the concrete under the pressure huge pressure similarly stress reaches the failure surface a parameterized damage d this d models govern the evolution of damage and which is driven by the plastic strain that means after reaching the failure surface d starts and it grows from 0 to and to 1 for a fully damaged material or residual surface there is no meridian or strain rate dependence and shear and shear strength it is only supported under confined condition that means positive pressure this surface this surface has no tensile strength only shear strength that is only because of confined condition for rst uh, parameters in this numerical study the compressive meridian uh, few uh, all the parameters are taken as follows 
only these four parameters are determined uh, with the help of curve fitting or two parameters the compressive meridian which is given by this equation is curve fit and the value of a and n are determined according to this curve by keeping fr which is rate sensitive function fr as 1 so in this equation basically the rate sensitive parameter are absent by keeping it 1 and a and n are calculated by curve fitting and which are obtained as 1.77 and 0.34 respectively for residual surface af and nf these are uh, what we call it iterative adjustment are done to calculate and to obtain these values and these values match a good uh, good results as compared to experimental one numerical study in numerical study the concrete model is taken care by met rst 272 and projectile model is taken care by met rigid 20 which is already incorporated in the ls rena module in order to reduce the calculation time and save computing processes quarter model is chosen due to the symmetry of the problems symmetry constraints are applied on the symmetry planes and fixed constraints on the target edges far from the impact point these model both the both the target and the projectile were mo are modeled with lagrangian mesh and eroding surface to surface contact is applied between them uh, apart from that as se severe distortion of the elements may occur and lead to significant error so to tackle this problem element will be deleted when equivalent plastic strain exceeds a certain limit value this is the geometry of the quarter model this plane is a plane of symmetry these two planes are fixed plane this is a projectile and this is a coarse uh, finer mesh to coarse mesh transition as shown here 1 mm 2 mm then 4 mm and bullet is uh, mesh fine with 1 mm results the experimental test damage uh, was obtained from the hand check uh, the front damage this figure shows front damage this one is rear damage at an velocity of 743 meter per second of impact velocity and this damage is calculated by measuring the diameter in four uh, different direction d1 d2 d3 and d4 after calculating these diameters the mean is taken the mid, so the mean diameter which is obtained from experimentally by hand check in 1992 are as follows 359 front 400 at rear and numerically uh, numerical study we obtained these values at front and rear while apart from that the depth of this front damage is reported as 60 mm and the damage depth of rear surface is reported as 60 mm and numerically i obtained these two which is shown here so after the numerical simulation the result shows this this one is the front diameter this is a damage contour this is a rear surface contour damage and these are the depth these are the front depth these are the rear depth and these are the damage contour same at 743 meter per second impact velocity and these are the velocity time curve at different impact velocities and these are the residual velocities and these are the perforation time or simulation time x axis these are time in millisecond and these are velocity in meter per second uh, this is a comparison between experimental and numerical data and these are the various impact velocities these are the experimental uh, data corresponding to various impact velocities and these are the numerical results uh, residual velocity 
corresponding to various impact velocity so the error was within 5% so the rst parameters values shows a good fit with the experimental one and these is a this is the curve fit with the black dot showing experimental result and orange dot and line shows numerical results conclusions in this paper henschek et al 1992 parasitic experiment test is used to verify the rst concrete model in ls dyna so on comparing numerical simulation results with the parasitic test data following main conclusions are made based on curve fitting of triaxial test data done by henschek et al um, in 1992 two parameters of failure surface are well determined based on relative adjustment two parameters of residual surfaces are well determined front and rear diameter obtained from numerical study show good fit to the ballistic test result as well as crater scale and tunnel depth obtained from the numerical study also shows good fit to the ballistic test results and lastly numerical perforation data for slab in 140 mega pascal concrete shows good fit to the ballistic test result that means which is already explained in within 5% of error these are the references thank you thank you uh, question please uh check i will check no questions online so a quick question from me uh okay. does you think that you miss something when you use a uh, quad model i mean uh, sometimes well if you have uh, crack propagations uh, the crack the crack propagation pattern can be uh, maybe it can be missed by your simplification of using the quad model okay. maybe in experiments you encountered some uh crack uh, pictures that wouldn't be fit by your model or not everything is fine okay so as far as the crack proportion is concerned and show you this one as far as crack propagation is concerned the rst model is yeah. not well is not well equipped with those governing equations it only uh, corresponding to plastic strains only mm -hmm. so the crack uh, govern so the crack in so the related governing equation uh, corresponding to the crack is not well developed in this model rst model i would say so for that a uh, few research, uh, researchers have developed their own model and incorporated those uh, governing equation using umat or vumat in this ls dyna software so for that uh, one has to develop his own governing equation and put into the photon uh, coding system and then uh, link it to the uh, ls dyna or other software uh, using vumat so uh, this is how it is Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Presentation, and that was the last presentation. So thanks everybody who stayed with us <laughs> for so long. Okay. Uh, take care, and probably see you next days.